As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. One of the worst performances of my career, and they never doubted it for a second. We all go a little mad sometimes. I believe there's a hero in all of us that keeps us honest, gives us strength, makes us noble. You just gotta keep living, man. L-I-V-I-N. Son of a bitch. He stole my life. I love the smell of my pump in the morning. Was 2023 the worst year of the 2020s in film? Welcome back to the Shop by Shop podcast. It's a big day today. We've officially recapped 2023 as a film year. And as we all know, once a year comes to an end, it te- typically is a time when everyone starts to reflect on the year. What were the best films? What were the worst films? What's changing in the industry? What do we want to see going forward? So we're going to recap all of that for you. We're going to uh, comment on the year, how we feel about it as a whole what our thoughts are on the future of cinema and what we're going to see in 2024 and years to come, along with a recap of our letterbox stats. And of course, 2023 2023 films ranked. We're going to do about our top 10, I believe, along with our most anticipated for next year, along with a review of our most anticipated for this past year and how those turned out, if those films lived up to expectations. And then to cap it off, our best theater experiences of the year. So let's get right into it. Oscar, what were your thoughts on 2023 as a film year as a whole? Yeah, it's it's an interesting year. Um, Film-wise, I thought it it was was good. It was solid. Um, Definitely not as good as last year for me. I think there was a lot more kind of consistent highs than last year. I had a lot more high ratings um, as well. I have, uh, I think, three, five stars on this year so far. Still got a few to see um, over here. But... um, for more i kind of took away from this year as a whole as a good is that people have like the general audience just started to reject that kind of franchise side of things we saw a lot of big bombs on the uh with, with things like marvel you saw indiana jones the flash things like that and that's probably the best takeaway out of this year for me as well as kind of the incredible films that we saw but i think honestly that's the best thing to come out of this year pete uh just people seeing less of those kind of films and um seeing Something like Oppenheimer, which I never would reckon would get near a billion at the start of the year, and people going to see a three-hour biopic in in that sense. But yeah, um, film-wise, a lot of stinkers and a lot of average this year, which didn't do it great. But um, in terms of kind of film as a whole, I thought it was a uh, a good uh, a good year for for that. Yeah, uh, Ryan. Yeah, I completely agree. Like, I'm I'm quite fifty fifty on the year as a whole. Like, the top of it has like some of my favorites of the decade, like Oppenheimer. Like you were saying, just a bunch of those. Like, my top five are like some of the best that have been re- released over the past few years. But the, yeah, there's there's some of the worst blockbusters we've ever seen, possibly like ever. Like the Indiana Jones's Transformers and Man Wonka. Like, you, sure we get a lot of bad movies like during the year but it's not usually like this type of quality gets released in cinemas usually it's like there's a lot of very low quality uninspired like bland cash grabs that um they go release straight to cinemas and at elite you're saying i mean people are getting sick of them because there's a lot of bomb a lot of big bombs this year like if if we look at a couple of years ago like even 2019 like all the big like hitters like the a billion um they were all like pretty bad movies like they just it didn't matter about the quality they would break a billion anyway um but with stuff like open armor barbie spider verse top in the charts like this year like things that actually have like a real passion and passionate filmmakers behind it so it's definitely a positive um coming out of this year um i've still got a lot of stuff slipping through the cracks like like mario's and stuff like that but it's, it's still kind of watchable so it's, it's not the worst but yeah a pretty decent year will be well Yeah, I tend to agree. All in all, I think 2023 was a pretty good uh, bounce back year for film. I kind of have the opinion that COVID was a bit of a recession uh, for movies. And we're kind of seeing a a resurgence, especially with 2022 and now 2023. I don't know if it stacks up with 2022 in terms of my favorite years of the decade. uh, But definitely second, maybe not definitely, but uh, one of my favorite years of this decade so far. And just a lot of really great movies that kind of came out of nowhere. Like we were talking about earlier, um, how some of our most anticipated films didn't really end up being necessarily the best films of the year. But like every year, films just kind of seemingly come out of nowhere and you just grow to love them. Like 
I was looking through the 2023 list. Godzilla minus one, The Holdovers, Iron Claw, May, December. Like there were just so many good movies that didn't really have a lot of promotion or a lot of backing, but I still got to experience them and a lot of other people did and they thoroughly enjoyed them. So I thought 2023 was a pretty deep year. I have zero five stars on the year, which is kind of weird. Like I've got two Oppenheimer and past lives. I can see maybe reaching that five stars, but zero five stars on the year. So not quite the highs of 2022, but a deep year, uh, nonetheless, for me, at least. Alex, did you have a take on that? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this film year, so I guess to start us off, for most of the year, I was calling this a dog shit film year, and not only a dog shit film year, probably the worst film year, maybe, since around like 2016. I really did not feel great about this film year at all, and I kind of was always uh, waiting for those fall releases to come, and I really didn't... Uh, they didn't really live up to expectations. I really think for me, a lot of the new releases this year are defined by disappointment. And, you know, maybe I think my expectations were just too high. And I think that could be because of myself, because I went in with insanely high expectations for this year. There was like 15 films I literally could not wait to see. And I think, you know, this is why I'm a pessimist. Everyone wonders why I'm so pessimistic. And it's because when I go with an optimistic mindset... I end up being disappointed. So maybe if I went in with lower expectations, I would have enjoyed a lot of these films more. But I think this year I really kind of changed a lot as a movie watcher and kind of learned a lot about myself as a movie watcher where I used to just see everything all the time. And I mostly did that this year. I don't know if I'm going to going forward where I feel like I'm at a point where I kind of seen enough that I don't need to see every Marvel movie or every blockbuster coming out anymore. And I'll, I don't think I'm going to continue to just see everything that is on the box office charts going forward. And I think what really I realize is what defines a great movie for me is its rewatchability. And I think when I look at 2021, which was a great, phenomenal film year, in my opinion, there were so many films. Like, there was like a good 12 to 15 films that I just wanted to watch again and again and again. And really, it's like films I saw three or five times in theaters because I was just that excited to rewatch them. Where this year, even a lot of the really great films, I didn't quite have that same excitement to rewatch. It's like, it's good. It's like, I, I there's things I respect about it, but I'm not, you know, dying to rewatch a lot of these films. And then the savior of 2023, the month of December, because December absolutely saved this film year, literally more than half of my top 15 came out in December, which is insane because it really was not a great film year. There was a great film month within this year. The rest of the year, it's like maybe we got one good movie a month. It's like July, we got Oppenheimer. We got a great movie. We got one great movie in July. Whereas it's like December, I feel like now because of the Oscars, we've seen like it, all the good releases get pushed back to the fall of the last few years. And now it's getting pushed back even further. And now they're all in the last month of the year. And I definitely think Christmas, uh, that whole two-week span around it, has become the biggest movie, uh, probably the most profitable time to release your movie. That's the most packed I've seen the theater all year. Like, every time throughout those two weeks I went, it was pretty mobbed. So it's definitely going to become a high-demand release date. And I think it is, like, a problem that, like, we're just getting, because then people are going to stop going to the movies because there's nothing out. But then they end up just never going back to the movie theater because you're releasing all the good all the good movies in one month of the year, which uh, I don't know how I feel about. But then personally for the year, I think the biggest thing for me is I discovered the film, my new favorite filmmaker who's tied with my other two filmmakers, and that's Juan Car Wai. I had seen In the Mood for Love a couple of times going into this year, but I had always wanted to check out the rest of his films and never had. And luckily I got to see Chungking Express this year in theaters, one of the best theater experiences of my life. Both times I saw it was some of the best theater experiences ever. And it just made me want to really dive into his film. So when I look back on this year, the biggest thing for me is discovering a filmmaker who's become my favorite filmmaker, and that's Juan Carwai. While also getting to see the entire Sight and Sound Top 100 in theaters, which was just an awesome experience. And thank you to the Philadelphia Film Center for that. But yeah, you guys were talking a lot about uh, the blockbusters losing money, Marvel movies. It didn't have the same success this year, even though I think it was a good year for blockbusters, actually. I think that a lot of the bad ones paid for it financially, which I think is great to see and is a big win. So, Will, what are your thoughts on just cinema going forward and just the state of the industry in the next couple of years to come? Yeah, I think 2023 was definitely a turning point, like uh, Oscar kind of alluded to earlier. The fact that 
Oppenheimer hit a billion dollars or close to it. And it's a three hour black and white movie about a uh, astrophysicist is pretty astounding, honestly. So we did kind of see that like <clears throat> hype built with Barbie and Oppenheimer to kind of collaborate their marketing to increase viewership for both of the movies. Um, but I think we'll hopefully see more of that in the future and not just with like Barbie and Christopher Nolan directed movies, but maybe like other more niche releases, they'll kind of combine their marketing efforts to try to get to more eyes and get to more screens. But uh, yeah, like it's it's really hard to know. Like we we'll never really know what the future holds for cinema, but I thought 2023 was definitely a, a good step forward. Like uh, Oscar said, we're kind of moving away from the Marvel box office you know, boomers, like, uh, uh, the MCU stuff, like the stuff that came out this year just wasn't that good in terms of the comic book movies. So if we kind of move away from that and, you know, give lesser known films a bit more of a chance and, um, like we saw with Barbie and Oppenheimer, even bigger films kind of collaborating together to create master big monster events to get more people in the cinema, which in turn, you know, results in more people watching more movies. So just any type of like mass marketing like that in the future, I think would be great. And it was cool that we saw it in 2023. But yeah, just kind of moving away from that block, those blockbusters with that are just devoid of emotion um, and kind of getting into some more niche films that more people should really see. And honestly, we see that this year too. Like the fact that Poor Things is going to get a Best Picture nomination is crazy. Like that movie is way too weird for the Oscars and it is picking up a ton of traction. So I think we are kind of seeing a little bit of the niche indie letterbox crowd kind of leak into the norm, which I think is good. That's a positive thing because what normal people watch isn't great. Um, so, but with the guidance of letterbox and this great podcast, I think we can uh, start trending movies in the right direction, but yeah, good year for 2023 overall. I'm really, I'm looking positive for next year and I'm looking pretty optimistic for years to come, but yeah, Oscar, did you have a, Anything to say about this upcoming year? Um, yeah, um, I really hope, like, this year kind of started, like, kind of the death of the franchise almost. Um, and I really hope, and looking at next year's schedule, I really think it's going to kill it off big time. There's, you just see, it's just littered with sequel after sequel after sequel. Sony are going to single-handedly just destroy... Um, superheroes even though it's already in a mess of its own well, their lineup is looking... Marvel, mate, with Deadpool for the, the, the yeah to be honest I don't, I, don't, I, I don't think that's going to be that great to be honest um but i think it's good to s that people are like over the past few years it started but i think now it's getting really into it that people are kind of turning to directors rather than actors when like going to see a, a film now like the mo like the definition of like a movie star is dying almost and People are looking forward uh, to seeing their favorite directors make new films rather than their favorite actors. And I honestly prefer that a lot more. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, like, for example, no Disney film reached a billion dollars this year. That hasn't happened in I goodness knows how long. It's been absolutely years, which is crazy. Also very, very good, to be honest, because um, they suck. Um, but... Yeah, I think as a whole, I am looking forward to next year because I think there's a lot to look forward to, but there's even more not to, in a sense. But I'm excited to see how the bad fails, um, and I hope it's a full awakening of people realizing. And someone like Martin Scorsese, like this year, has kind of helped that along big time. Like every time he releases a new film, but he he does it all the time, kind of waking people up. To realizing what cinema is now um and what it should be to be honest so i i'm looking forward to next year it's going to be a very 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 interesting year yeah just like you were saying like i think mainly the superhero genres kind of died uh like last year when um black adam came out that was kind of when we first seen that there weren't guaranteed box office hits and i think that's when people started considering maybe we're, we don't have to go to every single superhero movie and it really killed it this year. Like every single one that got released just done worse and worse. Um, like if we look at like the the biggest like misses of the year, like the top ten, like f all four of them are superhero movies, and with the number one being the Flash. And it's it's ridiculous the amount of money they put into these. Like the Flash, three hundred million budget, and it lost one hundred eighty million. Like the the bombs That's are ridiculous. Crazy. 
Down uh, Destiny I, bombing. The, big win. Yeah. I, I don't know. It wasn't sustainable to like have all these big budget movies with like ridiculous budgets. I think we've seen that with like Godzilla. Like we really don't need these ridiculous budgets. Like it was a uh, 15, 20 million. I think that movie was made. And it made about 70 million, which is pretty good for an international film and um, breaking into the mainstream audience. But yeah, I, I hope with all the superhero movies that kind of fallen off, it kind of allows the, the mid-budget movie maybe to make a return. We've seen that kind of this year with like comedies. There was stuff like No Hard Feelings, Bottoms, and they all done pretty well. So we're kind of getting that, and there's a lot of genre films. I think horror will do very well going forward. Um, obviously, I don't think it's in the best state they know with like stuff like Nick, Five Nights at Freddy's, Exorcist, Blumhouse's. Of the, Single handed, yeah, at the, the helm of new horror. horror. <laughs> <laughs> it's awful. Um, I, I hate it when Winnie the Pooh's done. I, I think we may look back on this period of horror like is like really damaging because we just keep seeing these like nothing budget, like royalty free, like really safe PG 13 um, yeah. horror films. Like Blumhouse is ruining horror. There's just there's nothing to it. Yeah, this trend of picking up just public domain stuff and turning them into a horror movie is the that's, worst trend of all that's time. Kind of and funny, I, to be you guys can so ask her on Twitter because he was tweeting about it. He called it. He's like, Mickey Mouse going to hit the public domain. And here we go. Of course, <laughs> We've Mickey had Mouse horror movie. Films, Nobody though. asked for this. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> I hate that they get so released funny. in theaters as well. Like, how, how do we live in a world where Winnie the Pooh made in seven days <laughs> gets pretty much the same release as a like, David Fincher Netflix film? Like mm. that is inside of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but we did, we did sort of good horror, like Godzilla, if you consider that horror. Um, talk to me. That was probably one of the biggest surprises of the year. Mm. Um, so yeah. It's in a, it's in an all right state if you ignore the like top ten worst films of the year that it came out of it. But... I think A twenty four moving forward is gonna be interesting because they seem like they're going for the, the, the money grab slightly um and now Dwayne Johnson money. with Dwayne Johnson that kind of by just yeah they're moving towards that kind of area at the moment well, but yeah I think A24 is not really like a, the indie you know film production company that it once was like no. a lot of my friends think see A24 and they're like oh small little production company it's like yeah not anymore not. like A24 is one of the pillars of cinema like they're they're pushing out millions and millions and millions of dollars with the movies so I think yeah, their their step into the mainstream has kind of, you know, lessened the artfulness of some of their prior works that what which made them so great. So hopefully we see like another independent film or like just more indie film production companies kind of spurred up all over the place because I think mm. the market is kind of void of that right now. Like what A twenty four was a couple of years ago, we could really use. And we we're talking about like, yeah, we we're talking good. about like horror. Yeah, but and we're talking about horror movies. Distribution absolutely sucks. Yeah, I know, it's and so that's bad. that's kind of the nature of Hollywood, though, right? Like, it's really hard to get a movie made, and not only get it made, but to send it to the audiences and put it in the in the right theaters for enough people to see. So, yeah, hopefully we kind of see something kind of emerge there, or at least A twenty four go back to their roots a little bit, because I do agree with Oscar; they have kind of sold out a little bit on their last previous projects. They've had some, uh, some bombs this year. Oh, God. Don't remind me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, 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 they've lost a bit of money this year, though. They Birds Afraid did not do well at all. Um, what else did they release this year that didn't do very well? Talk To Me did very well. Um, Zone of Interest, mm -hmm. I imagine, won't make much. Um, what else? Um, well, they've put Priscilla... lots of money into what's the Civil War movie that comes out next year as well. That's their biggest budget movie, I think. What's that? Um, Alex Garland's movie. Oh, Civil War. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, it's like um, 80 million. Yeah, I think that's a, yeah, like you said, it's that biggest budget film. Um, yeah, it's just interesting. I just, the 24 discourse which really annoys me. And hopefully people stop acting like they write and direct every single one of their projects and that the actual write and directors actually do exist and actually there. It's crazy. I mean, it kind of made sense when it was like 10 movies and they were kind of like a Blumhouse, like, kind of yeah everywhere like it was kind of similar but there's so many like different movies and it's different genres completely now. quite all the time now it's... they just go to a festival and just buy a film the distribution rights to it i know that that's yeah. what they do and now i'm really happy that they do that yeah it's but... a bad thing but people don't realize that's what it's <laughs> i know all right i'm yeah. gonna cut in here 
I hope you enjoyed Will and Oscar's optimism because it's time to hear from the best. <laughs> I don't feel good about the future of cinema at all. I think it's it's in a shit state right now. Look at what's made money this year. They're, you know, it, Mario it, Bros. It's, the end of the you year. You gave Mario year, five out of five, and it was yeah, the and that's the number one year. But <laughs> this is listen. The end of the year. That well. is election day for movies. That is when everyone looks at what made money. And they decide what they're gonna, what movies they're gonna make going forward. Oppenheimer aside, everything on there is a remake, spinoff, or sequel. We can sit here and talk about all the films we love from this year. I guarantee the majority of all of our top tens lost money. So many great films throughout 2021, 2022, and 2023. Which you know, I'm very big on 21 and 22 as film years. I think 23 is a very solidly good film year. Lots of great films came out these years. And pretty much all of them lost money. All of these are losing money. And A24, we've obviously given a lot of praise to. And we we give a lot of praise to them frequently as they absolutely deserve. A24 right now is the peak of what every young director wants to be. Everyone who's trying to break into the industry is saying, I want to be able to work for A24. And I think the industry needs A24 because who's going to want to work in this industry with the long hours and all of the, the things it requires to make it in this industry? without the hope that you can one day work for someone like them. And they, now they've lost money on essentially nearly every film this year, along with the fact that they're now doing IP movies. And I think that when they do IP movies, they will be very good IP movies. I think it'll be things like The Iron Claw and Godzilla Minus One. I know they would make Godzilla Minus One, but I think it'll be things like that. But still, the fact that they need to do this to be profitable is a very sad state of where the industry's at. Now, the good thing is, I think Asia is absolutely about to take over. I think Korea and Japan are killing it, and they're making a lot of money, and more of their films are traveling over here and have lived up to a very high quality. So I think, you know, right now, it, the Asian cinema, mainly in Korea and Japan, is a shining light in the film industry and the art form of film. But I think in America, it's it's in a very bad state right now. I think that people, we see these films like The Flash and, you know, Indiana Jones losing money. But that doesn't mean that the good films are making money. They're not saying, I'm not going to watch The Flash and I'm going to go see, you know, the uh, Asteroid City. They're just saying, I'm just not going to go to the movies. I'm going to sit home and binge Netflix. So that's, I think, a problem. Now, what it could be very hopeful is, like I said, there is still Oppenheimer in that top uh, box office list. And a part of that is just because Christopher Nolan is a household name himself. And you could argue Christopher Nolan's name is an IP, but at the same time... They created a true event out of this. And I think in the future, you're going to really need to find a way to make an event. I do think that's going to wear out over time as it's like, all right, it's like not every weekend or every once a month movie is going to be this big event the way Barbenheimer was. But to some degree, you're going to need to be able to create excitement. You're going to need to, like Barbie did, get people posting on social media and generating online conversation. Actually, let me quickly ask these, everyone this. Why do you think Marvel has been top dog for all of the 2010s? I think it's one reason and one reason only. But I'm curious what the three of you think. You're muted, Will. You like it? Muted. Sorry, I think, I think there's not one particular thing that's made Marvel necessarily on top. I think... There's a multitude of things that have made them monopolize the market, but I'm curious to see what you think is the one reason. One reason, one reason only that is the ability to generate conversation online. No one has been better at generating internet conversation than Marvel through all the free YouTube press they're getting through YouTube videos of Easter egg breakdowns, what this post credit scene means, you know, what's it going to mean for the future, the curiosity of where the franchise is going to go. I don't think any franchise is generating online conversation like Marvel has. And I think that's what people are going to need to do going forward is, you know, and Barbenheimer did that. Barbenheimer generated online conversation and got people excited that way. And I think TV's done a much better job at that than film has. And I think that's what, I think a lot of the marketing teams and the people who are, their job is not to make the movie, but to sell the movie are going to need to figure out better ways to do that going forward. I don't, I wish it wasn't that way, but I think that's just the reality of where we're at. I think that, like I agree with the Oscar said, I think the era of the movie stars dead and the only kind of way you can sell the movie with stars is you need to package a lot of stars into this movie. Like you used to be able to say Tom Cruise in this movie. Now when you say Tom Cruise in this movie, they say who else? Like 
people want to see not just a star in the movie. They want to see, you know, five, six stars and familiar names for you to be able to sell your movie that way. I do think, unfortunately, back to my pessimism, as always, I think that um, I don't agree with Ryan. I think the mid-budget film is going to go more and more away. I don't think we're going to see it come back. I hope the next this time next year he's telling me I told you so, but I just think that the budget gap is actually going to get even further, and I think the films that we love are going to get lower budgets due to them not making a lot of profit. Therefore, they're going to need to have a lower budget to make a profit back. I do think horror is going to be thriving. I think, you know, every young filmmaker, most of them are trying horror right now. I think we're going to keep seeing a lot of horror movies. And I do think Letterbox is going to be essential at the end of the day to saving all of this. I think that Letterbox is, you know, getting people more excited about filmmakers and, you know, taking off all the filmography of the filmmaker. So I think Letterbox is going to be insanely important, but I also think Letterbox is moving somewhat downhill a little bit i think that some of their scores are not as reliable as they were one year ago they're still the best rating site of anyone but i think that they're not quite they, you see a lot of stupid reviews get a lot of likes now you see a lot of you know ratings that are not quite as reflective as i think they used to be but i i still am faithful that letterbox will be a savior in our 2022 episode we went more in depth with you know what Letterboxd is going to mean for the future of film, so we highly recommend you check that out if you're more interested to hear about that. But, yeah, does anyone else have any wrap-up thoughts on the future of cinema? Because, obviously, yeah, just that I'm not right about a lot of this. But Yeah, just regarding what you're saying with Marvel, like, I definitely see what you're saying. What you're saying is totally true. But I think it, what it comes down to is money, right? The MCU is sitting on billions and millions of dollars, so... They can get the biggest names, they can get the best writers, they can go out and just source all this shit. So their their network just allows them to reach more people. And like with movies like Oppenheimer, the, one of the reasons it did so well is like you mentioned, it had this social media marketing campaign that blew up. So I think it's a little bit unrealistic to assume that every movie that gets released in the future is going to have some, some sort of marketing campaign similar to the MCU or Oppenheimer. But I think if we just get away from promoting that type of filmmaking, like when people aren't going to Flash and people aren't going to Quantum Media and stuff, like I think that is a good thing. Like although they're not going to see a uh, niche indie movie or whatever, they're just getting away from the franchise is in inherently doing good, in my opinion. So I think in this last year, 2023, we've actively done that. So we've done the first step of stepping away from the big market IPs, which I think is a positive foresight. And then with the mid-budget as well, like, I'd, I'd love to agree with Ryan and think that the mid-budget's going to make this comeback, like, the 90s. Like, mid-budget movies are some of my favorite movies. Um, but as of late, we haven't seen it because you got to spend a million to make a million, right? you got to spend hundreds of millions to make hundreds of millions. But as of late, we've seen a bit more independent films kind of pop up, more so internationally, not necessarily Hollywood, but, like, Godzilla. That was, like, barely a $15 million budget, and it did extremely well looked really good so i think there is a way where a mid-budget film can exist it can make money and can appeal to wider audiences and niche audiences so it's just about finding that balance and i don't know not buying tickets to marble movies <laughs> that's the, the crux of my argument here i need to agree and disagree with you here i agree with you that i should have mentioned godzilla with their smaller budget making what they did is a gigantic win across cinema all around that i think you know, I'm really excited when we do a full episode on that there's so much I have to say about that. But I think Godzilla Minus One is a saving grace that is really could be a big revival of blockbusters and give us more like what we saw in the 80s with, you know, good Spielberg style blockbusters. As for, uh, you know, you saying them not going to see the Marvel movies like Quantum Media is a good thing. I, I get what you're saying. I agree that it's not a good thing. I mean, that is a good thing. But I think that the problem is that a lot of them are not just they're, they're still going to bad franchise thing is us as a movie podcast are only looking at the film they consume and i think now a lot of them are just going to bad tv franchises instead so if you're going to watch bad franchises i would rather them go see quantum mania at least be supporting movie theaters than be watching a shitty tv franchise where i think a lot of them are going so that's why i kind of have to disagree there but i i do get what you're saying i don't want to see quantum mania as mm -hmm. you know the big box office juggernaut of the year either but the MCU basically was TV. That was like how they kind of hook, hooked everybody. Like you had to go and see every new movie. Like it was a new episode, mm -hmm. and they, I think they've kind of started to lose that, and that's why um, they're not making as much money. But yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at the top ten here. Like they are just all franchise movies. Um, 
I mean, some of the best movies were independent movies, but um, credit to Nathan from the, the Real Talk podcast for doing this because he's got a lot of data into the top 10, but it's just like Mario, Barbie, Oppenheimer, Spider-Verse, Guardians of the Galaxy, John Wick, Five Nights at Freddy's, think, Hunger Games, yeah. Wonka, and Elemental. Like, it, it, it's all just still blockbusters and big franchises or sequels that we're seeing in the top 10, so it's not entirely outside the norm. But that's never gotta, really going to change, you know? Like, yeah, more no people are always going to see more things that they know. Like, less people will see less things that they know, so. But, but um, real quick, I know that, you know, if Bo is Afraid, let's say, is never going to make it be a billion-dollar movie and going to be on the top 10 box office list. The problem is that these independent movies are not making a profit relative to their budget either. It's like, you know they're not going to be the, the billion-dollar movie, but it's like if the movie has a twenty million dollar budget, you hope that it makes forty, and it's like they're not making forty, and that that's where I think the the real problem is. Well, like everywhere, ever, everywhere, all at once. Um, last year that only got a hundred, and it got like all the buzz of winning Best Picture and everything, and it still only has a hundred. So, like, what can you expect from something that doesn't get all that press? Like, yeah, exactly. Like you said, it's not achievable to like even double your budget. Yeah, and as far as everything ever all at once, like this is. Like we're we're not going to get into our Oscar predictions in this episode. We're not going to talk about what we would pick for the Oscar because we have a whole nother episode we we're going to do where we're going to go all into what we think is going to win the awards. We think will get nominated and what we would pick ourselves. But I, I think what you're talking about is exactly why the Oscars are so important. And everything everyone wants, luckily, was a film that made money even before its Oscar success. But the Oscars is like I said, like the the end of the year is election day for film because that's when. You see what made money and what they're going to want to make going forward. The kind of aftermath last chance of these independent films is to win awards. Because one, it can generate more box office from the excitement. Along with the fact that even if, let's say, your film loses money and it wins an Oscar, that, and that adds a level of prestige to the studio that they want. They all want to believe that they are prestigious at the same time. So winning an Oscar is kind of like a, another way to make your film valuable, even if you lose money, which is why... You know, some people say, oh, the Oscars is a joke. It's not important. Like, no, the Oscars is very important because that's a lot of what is keeping these good independent films getting made, which is why I think that's so essential. Yeah, okay, exactly. with the well, Oscars some, is like, important, some, some... but not the people who make the decisions at the Oscars. Oh, Let's yeah, get yeah. that. <laughs> the certain yeah, yeah. the right one. But when they yeah. do, the, them, the decision that they choose to make can have a big one. positive impact on film. They mm. just don't always make the decision that will have <laughs> Right, <it>. right. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, so like some of the stuff that came out this year, like Killers of the Flower Moon, The Killer, like they're not necessarily made to make like profits or anything. Like they're that's Netflix, Apple buying these big movies, giving two hundred million to big filmmakers, like trying to get that Oscar. Like it's a bonus them putting out in the cinema to get profits. So like, mm. yeah, that is a good side of it. There's, I just the with kind of people not seeing like superhero things. I think a lot of it just comes to like comes down to like online discourse and critics because I think I think now there's a lot of that. I feel like something like Birds of Prey that's that had kind of a lot of discourse online. Obviously, very weird film, um, and I think that had I think something like that and Babylon um, are partly to blame about why those things kind of flopped because people just kind of going online there's there's just kind of a norm of people don't usually like like weird films or overly sexual films and things like that and that's not the whole reason why they fall but i just think especially with things like superhero films as well there's just um you know critics maybe didn't like them a lot which they didn't and i think that has played into a big part of it this year which some for good some for worse but it's going to be interesting to see going forward. Um, and I hope the Rotten Tomatoes debate gets left uh, in 2023 because I do not want to see any of that this year, but it, it's bound to be, unfortunately. Yeah, can we start with letterbox debates? Yeah, Ryan, why don't you start us off? So we're going to review our letterbox stats and we're going to kind of comment on them. Uh, so Ryan, why don't you start us off with your letterbox stats? Wait a second, I do not have it ready. Does anybody else have theirs? Right. <laughs> anyone have enough? I got mine up as a butt. All right, let's start off with our most watched of the year. So the my numbers are actually down here. I normally have at least one film that's around seven, eight watches. Oh, get ready. Get ready for uh, all of your angry comments. My most watched film at six times this year, all in theaters, 
Super Mario Brothers. There's no way. Are so you actually guys in it? Oh, that's actually bad. That okay? So we're holding auditions for a fourth co-host of the Shot by Shot podcast. <laughs> part of that is because I have younger cousins who I had to take to this movie. Okay. And then uh, sure, 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 sure. That's, that's definitely the reason. The other half is absolutely loving this movie, which you know I'll, I'll talk about another time. I don't want to spend too much time on those about the letterbox stats. Next, I have Goodfellas and Babylon of five watches. All five were in theaters for Babylon. Chongqing Express, Batman 89, Across the Spider-Verse, Oppenheimer, and Sunset Boulevard of four watches. Those are my most watched. Fair. For the year. Nice. Who wants to go next? Um, for the year of 2023, I have 832 diary entries. Um, I've, that's definitely my highest um, so far since using Letterbox. Um, my most watched movie is Oppenheimer. That's four times all in theaters. Um, Asteroid City four times. That's two times in theaters. Um, Holland Drive. Um, Street of Dreams, the big short film of the year. Five out of five. Exorcist, Book of Nights, Sunset Boulevard. A lot of movies that we like reviewed in other episodes that I just re- rewatched a couple of times. Um, and of course, Babylon, the best film of the decade. So yeah, easily the best film of the decade. That's my little box wrap. Nice. Um, All right, Oscar, what are yours? So um, I have a tie <laughs> for most. <laughs> How many films? Expose yourself. Uh, one. Give the full stats. <laughs> <laughs> We'll leave it there. <clears throat> um, <laughs> um, so I have a tie for most watch, which is uh, between La La Land and Dune. I watched both six times this year. Um, La La Land uh, was once with a live orchestra um, the other week, which is incredible. Um, and then, yeah, Dune six times, because why not? Um I saw Babylon five times, all in theatres, last year. Um, Oppenheimer four times, all in theatres, all in cinema. Um, I watched Blade Runner and Blade Runner 2049 both three times. Once of each were both in cinema. Um, And I watched her three times as well. Yeah, so I wouldn't that's... really think of her as a rewatchable movie, but I guess it kind of is. Yeah, it's kind of one of those um, lonely night kind of films I just stick on when I'm in the mood. I kind of like it. Well, I don't like it. I love it. <laughs> Such a great film. Will. Sorry, my headphones keep dying. Um... But I can do some of my most watched. So I watched four movies four times this year. And these are like among my favorite movies. So it makes sense. So The Social Network I watched four times. Fantastic Mr. Fox I watched four times. Oppenheimer I watched four times. All in theaters. Uh, and Dune I watched four times. Uh, and then some three, three-time three watches were After Sun, The Batman, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and Across the Spider-Verse. Significant I never realized... Watched. That there are people that don't like Ferris Bueller's Day Off. That's crazy. I know. I, I, I will never film. get the. I will never get the hatred. It is one of my favorites of all time. Like it. It's got so much rewatch value too. Uh, you can watch it every single day. It's so funny. So it's a nice low for you to have. Oh, shut up, bro. Even bro's got up half. and Ferris Bueller's Day Off at a three and a half. I can't. <laughs> or up's even lower, I think. No, no, no. Three. three and a half. It's not that low. <laughs> All right, uh, I, I forgot to do my vlog numbers. So th- I watched 516 films, uh, over 300 of those in theaters. I don't think anyone is topping that number. Uh, I think I, I was about, I think I was about I, 120 times I was uh, went to saw things in cinemas this year. Yeah. I, I, I should have actually counted before this episode, but I know that the last time I counted, it was in 300s, and I've seen more since then, so... It's somewhere in the 300 range, probably around 350, the number that I saw in theaters. Cause... Damn. That's a lucky really man to have such good cinemas around him. 
I am very blessed for the incredible Philadelphia theater scene. Shout out to the Philadelphia Film Center, the Ritz East, and uh, you know all those great theaters around me that should play these great films like The Sight and Sound. I watched it. Uh, my hours were basically 980, 990 hours worth of films watched this year. What were your hours, Oscar? Double that. <laughs> nope. 1,800. I thought I was psychotic. Then I met Oscar. Minus 631. A much more respectable <laughs> amount of time. <laughs> You're sure it's I'm, I'm not. Sure. You started logging the Super Bowl already this slowly. year. You logged the Super Bowl already this year. Who's logging the Super Bowl? Who's Who's logging the Super Bowl? <laughs> I did. I did. I'll, I'll never log that Super Bowl, and I don't want another mention of the Super Bowl. On the, I'm not uh, watching the Super Bowl. It's just for <laughs> <laughs> Alex's Eagles fans for anyone wondering you can slander him in the comments you slander the person I'll find you on hunt me down well I think I think it's safe to say that 2023 was probably all of our biggest years in terms of watching movies mm -hmm. uh, as it yeah all in the ingredients there so hopefully in 2024 we can beat those numbers even more so Oscar please don't beat your numbers good luck Oscar so what were everyone's top I, I don't want to trust me I don't want to <laughs> <laughs> but I've I've already watched twelve films so far this year, and it's going to be already 13. at twelve. Oh my god! It's going to be thirteen soon. You're nuts, dude. All right, since All right, Alex, Alex, yeah. Most, why don't you start us off? Who are, you, who are your top five most watched actors this year? Yes, I'll go since <laughs> uh, um, number one for me, Robert De Niro, twelve films. Leonardo DiCaprio, nine films. Samuel Jackson and Harrison Ford, eight films. I guess we'll go ten. Tony Leung, Tom Hanks, seven films. William Dafoe, Natalie Portman, Tom Cruise, Nick Cage, six films. You, Nick Cage. Yeah, six? Why do you hate Nick, Nick Cage so much? He's a oh, below yeah. average actor. What as bad as Tom Hardy? I mean, Did I don't know. They're comparably bad. I, <laughs> I can't believe you hate. Him. That's ridiculous. Okay, well, mine mine are actually like the best actors of all time. So there's no disputing this. <laughs> um, my most Gary Oldman eight, Willem Dafoe seven films, Philip Seymour Hoffman seven films, Jason Schwartzman seven films, Ralph Fiennes seven films, and Emma Stone seven films. And then Leonardo DiCaprio, nice. Ethan Hawke, and Mahershala Ali with six. Nice. Ethan Hawke is the goat. <clears throat> um, Super underrated. My, my most watched actor was William Dafoe this year. Great actor um, on 13 films. And then on 12, I have Wacky Phoenix and Philip Seymour Hoffman. Um, and then on 11, I have John C. Riley, Emma Watson, and Ralph Fiennes. Um, and then all on 10, I have um, Robert De Niro, Gary Oldman, Daniel Radcliffe. A lot of Harry Potter um, yeah. merchants in there. Um, but yeah. <laughs> William I Dafoe. Yeah, I've seen him at the top of a lot of people's this year. Um, yeah, if, if you've watched through all the movies, though, it'll it'll add up pretty quickly. Did you just see number one? William Dafoe. Oh, he's also my number one, but I think it's because yeah. of like Spider Man 3 rewatches. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at 14. Um, films. Wilder Heart Twice, couple of Spider Man, um, The Card Counter. Is it the first John Wick? Oh, for me, it's fantastic, Mr. Fox. As for it's like in that once. It's <clears throat> ridiculous. Uh, poor things, yeah. I guess so yeah, he deservedly so. One. He is an amazing actor. Um, yep, yeah. one of probably in my top five to be fair. Um, number two, I have um, De Niro with thirteen films. I think that's because of my Scorsese binge from two months ago, which is basically most of them. Um, Gary Oldman is probably from Harry Potter, like you were saying as well. Oh well, he's only in two films. Oh, oh but that'll be Christopher Nolan binge actually. Um, and then Jason Schwartzman with 10 films, um, Harry Dean Stanton with 10 films, DiCaprio 10, Ralph Fiennes 10, Sylvester Stallone from my Rocky binge at the start of the year, and then Tom Cruise with 9 films. Nice. 
we've got some pretty elite actors on our lists here, but I feel like that's mm. to be expected. Yeah. Films. I think my actors always ends up being random because I don't really often watch my actors with the exception of a few of them. It really is a, more of a product of the directors I'm watching and which actors just happen to fall in line with those films that I'm watching. But mm. that be, that, let's move into directors. So I think this one, I, I think we should go through our full list, just kind of rapid fire through them. Yeah. Number one for me, actually tied at number one, we have The Goat, The Greatest of All Time, Martin Scorsese with 12 films. I think all of those were in theaters. David Lynch, 12 films. We did a podcast on him, him so I've rewatched uh, every David Lynch film. Actually, four of those are his short films, but I've watched eight of his films. Haven't seen Dune or Twin Peaks, but 12 David Lynch films, that's actually really like eight. All 10 films of The Other Goat, Wong Kar Wai. Eight Stanley Kubrick films, a lot of those in theaters. Got another run in theaters of Billy Wilder films, eight Wilder films. Seven Hitchcock films, seven from Igmar Bergman. Six from Nolan. I think all of those are in theaters. Five from a director who I discovered this year and has become one who I really enjoy watching his work a lot and got to see all of them in theaters because they did a run of his filmography, and that is Yorgos Lanthimos. Five from The Maestro and the other goat, Federico Fellini, who that, that number is actually very low this year, surprisingly, even though there's, there's a lot of rewatches of those five within this year. Five from John Turtletob, actually one of the great blockbuster directors of Hollywood. Four from Steven Spielberg, very low number for him. Four from Francois Truffaut. Four from one of the other great masters of cinema, Sergio Leone. And then three from the following directors, Michael Mann, John Woo, Ari Aster, Ryan's Idol and Messiah, James Cameron, Tim Burton, and John Carpenter. James Cameron is not high enough. That was a pretty eclectic mix, though. Pretty uh, diverse group of directors, I'd say. A sorry and lack of women, Alex. You misogynist. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's actually a lack of women on my list as well. So maybe 2024, I'll kick off with some more female directors. Well, listen, when Charlotte Wells' filmography fills up, she'll be on this list probably. Every Absolutely. Year, so. Couldn't yeah. agree more. And honestly, yep. Fiamma doesn't have a ton of films herself yet either. I think she's only done like four or five films so far. So, well, yeah, a lot of the good female have or like don't, their filmographies aren't as long yet as a lot. Yeah, of there's them. a there's a lot of great up and coming female directors. Exactly, there's been some fantastic directorial debuts, and um, I've forgotten her name. The person who did Titan and Raw, um, probably my favorite female director at the moment. She's fantastic. Um, okay, I guess I'll, I'll go through mine, if that's cool. all right. Um, at the top, I've got the king, the master of suspense, some may call him, Alfred Hitchcock, nine films. Additionally, I watched nine Wes Anderson films. Those are two directors that I made an effort to like get through their filmography this year. I'm not fully complete on both of them, but nearing completion on both of them, which I hope to do in 2024. And then I have David Lynch and Martin Scorsese with seven films. Again, two directors I kind of wanted to work through before seeing Killers of the Flower Moon and then before doing our podcast. And then five films. I've got Christopher Nolan, Richard Linklater, and Paul Thomas Anderson. Three of my favorite directors, great current modern directors. And then these guys all have three. Matt Reeves, David Fincher, Steven Spielberg, John Hughes, Billy Wilder, Dennis Villeneuve, and Ryan Coogler. So, yeah, a lot of white males as well for me, but a pretty good mix of, of directors, I'd say. Nice. Um, I need to say, actually, you, you brought my attention that I'm totally surprised Richard Linklater didn't make my list because he always does. He's one of my favorite directors. Paul mm -hmm. Thomas Anderson, too, but I did his whole filmography last year, so that doesn't surprise me as much, but I can't believe Linklater's not on my list now that you mention it. Definitely. Um, for me, clearly... Clearly in the lead is David Lynch with 16 films for me. Um, that does include Twin Peaks and a couple short of his short films. Um, yeah, that's by a decent amount. And then second place with 12 films, I've got Ingmar Bergman. Hell of a director. Had such a great time this year going through kind of those 12 films of his. He has so many films, so I'm very happy. Um, or I'll be very happy when I kind of get through some more this year because I'm really looking forward to it. And then... 10 films, I have Denis Villeneuve, one of my favorite directors. And then I have a lot on 10 films, actually. So also on 10 films, I've got Alfred Hitchcock, 
um had a great time going through i think i this year was the year i started watching hitchcock films because i hadn't seen any before 2023 um so very happy with that such a fascinating director also on 10 stanley kubrick um watched a ton nearly all of his films this year still got a few more to go but one of the greatest trevor do obviously um painfully i had to watch 10 Wes anderson films this year it uh to be fair, the short films that he did for Netflix, uh, I thought it was better than the most majority of his filmography, to be honest. I actually quite like those. Um, um, but they I were really including that. I why people put them above his movies. Like, I think they're like towards the bottom of his filmography. I agree. I think. To be fair, uh, I've moved Asteroid City up the more the year has gone on. So you'd be glad exactly. to know that. Asteroid City is going to be the aging movie of this year. Like in 10 years time, people are going to come back around to Asteroid City and be like, this is a masterpiece of all genres. I'm just it's waiting. It's, it's, the, it's his most thought provoking film, in my opinion. Yeah, it's his that's, most ambitious, like why. stylistically and thematically, I think. Mm. And we'll be robbed at the Oscars this year, which in our Oscars. Oh, it's so. getting absolutely nothing. It's getting I nothing. Even though it exists. It's not even getting production design. They hate Wes Anderson more than Tom Cruise. And also on 10 films, I watched 10 of Akira Kurosawa's films this year, which was incredible to go through because I love doing that so, so much. Um, And then on to nine, I have Brian De Palma, who I also watched a ton of this year, and he's such an incredible... One of the best directors out there, honestly. His, His juice is unreal um even though scarface is his worst film um catching a stray you had a bad experience like there's none to do with <laughs> no no, no. i the film is like, still not that easy. good <laughs> um <clears throat> i went back and rewatched nine christopher nolan films this year um to a lot of people's dislike because i lowered the vast majority of them and I, I watched insomnia in the following for the first time um yeah, in, I'm glad I did, though, because, yeah, they have dropped a lot. Um, nine full Thomas Anderson films this year. Incredible, incredible director. Um, one of my favorites. Eight George Melia's films. The short film Goats. <laughs> whenever, <laughs> whenever, I, whenever I'm in need of a log, I just stick one of those on. Um, <laughs> short film yeah, Merchant. Get a thousand logs with a few George Melia logs. He was a great director. His films were fire. He was. No, they're, they're actually good. Like, don't just watch them because they're short. Is that you finished? No, sorry. He's such a fascinating director, though. He, like, his short films are incredible. Um, um, eight David Cronenberg films. Um, I love him. Just such a weird director. I'm very excited for his next film. Eight Dario Agenda films. Also one of the horror goats as well. Such a good time going through his filmography. Eight Scorsese films um, and eight Linklater films. Seven Terrence Malick films. Also now one of my favorite directors. Um, I watched the entirety of Tarkovsky's filmography this year, which is fascinating. Um, really, really didn't dislike one of them at all. I really enjoyed all of them. Um, Six Ridley Scott films and six Damien Chazelle films, which definitely included the Whiplash shorts. But yeah, very, very good year. Yeah, it's like interesting, like you said, Alex, like looking between like your director's most watching, your actor's most watch, you can just see the pattern of just going for directors rather than actors. And you which... can see which actors like to work with the same directors, which is kind of cool. Like taste more, honestly. Minus Wes Anderson. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually hadn't looked at many. Like, there's a lot of directors here that I discovered this year, and like they are like quite high up on my like all time rankings now. Um, but yeah, in my number one, I have someone who is far ahead of the rest. I've Martin Scorsese, and I watched every single film in short he basically ever made before Killers of the Flower Moon. So I've watched 28 Scorsese films this year. <laughs> this was uh, your year of Scorsese. Yeah. Dang. He's by far in my head. Oh. That's cool. In second place, I'm still pretty high. I've got 14 films with Spielberg. 
Um, that was the the Fable Mins came out like December, January time. So after that, I was kind of inspired to go back and rewatch all these films with a different like viewpoint of his like just horrible childhood, basically. <laughs> so I, I went back through and watched most of that. Um, Thirteen films with Hitchcock. Um, Hitchcock's that I go to whenever me and Will do a watch party for old Hollywood. So I, I've seen a lot of those. Um, David Lynch. Um, we done that with the. A film of pre episode a couple of weeks ago, so I rewatched basically everything he'd done for that for 13. Wes Anderson, 13 films as well. I think I've rewatched all these films. Nolan, the same for Oppenheimer coming out. Um, Brian De Palma, like Oscar was saying, he's just got insane just like he's definitely up there in my directors now. Um, I've only seen nine of his films though, I think. I've still got quite a few to watch, um, especially some of his highly acclaimed ones. Um, Dario Argento, another one. He's one of the horror goats, I think, now. And unfortunately, he's fell off quite a bit since like the 90s. So I've kind of stopped after I got to like nine films. But he's a great director. Billy Wilder, another one of my favourite um, directors now with nine films. And then I've just got a couple Coppola with eight, Kubrick with seven, George Merlier, um, The Short King, seven films, Sam Raimi, yeah, six films. I love, I love my favorite, my favorite directors are here, um, as you'd expect. Yeah. All right, and then I guess the last little segment we'll do in this uh, letterbox chapter of the, the episode. What films have you rated higher than average, and what have you rated lower than average? So for me to start us off, higher than average, the one, the only, the masterpiece, Act of the Clones, five stars. I was expecting Super Mario Bros. To be honest, uh, you're such an unserious person. Five stars. Also, five stars. We have Batman 1966 and Kevin Smith's Ball Rats, and then a film which should not be higher than average because the average should be higher. This is actually a great film, the original Top Gun, and then the last one I have Jingle All the Way at a four and a half, which is apparently higher than average as well. Yes, yeah, you have Top Gun at five. Oh, you see, Tyler, the first Top Gun's one of my favorite movies ever. Like that's like a childhood classic. What's it rated? Top what is what's the average yeah. rating for Top Gun? The average is a three three, which is way too low oh, for that movie. That is like, I understand it's not in the fours, but that should be like a good like three six, three seven range. Interesting. As for my lower than average, we have Wet Hot American Summer. Rewatch that. All shit. We have uh Film I saw at the festival called The Brighter Tomorrow. I thought it was super boring. I also gave that a one and a half. Hill Blue Eye made my least favorite film from last year, one and a half. That apparently people like more than I did. Uh, Robert Altman's uh, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, which I was not a big fan of. That is a 4.1 average, but I gave it a 2.5. Was not a big fan. Dog Shit, New Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem, two stars. And last but not least a film that has way too high of an average this film's average should be in the ones because it's such an atrocious piece of shit it was so hard to sit through even with the live orchestra it still got one and a half stars it's such a dog shit piece of shit movie and that is star wars the force awakens no way yeah force awakens are bad attack of the clones is a five attack of the clones is a masterpiece that's crazy. <laughs> this is garbage. Star Wars fans are something else, man. Force <laughs> Wiggins is not real Star Wars. Force Lucas had nothing to do with it, therefore it's not Star Wars. You're right, I forgot. You you hold this opinion that they're two separate entities. They are. They came from, <laughs> one came from a creative mind of one artist to the other came from a corporate committee trying to make money. They are not the same thing. I don't know. I, I won't disagree. I won't disagree. Um, I think mine are a little bit less interesting than yours, to be fair. But my first one is The Lion King, but it's the live action Lion King. I gave that a four stars, except the the average rating is a 2.74. I didn't know people hated it that this much. Wait, it's literally a sh- four stars. Is that the John Favreau one? Yeah. yeah. It, it's a shot for shot remake of the OG Lion King. Like, obviously, it doesn't have like the funky, cool facial animations but i I thought it was spectacular um so i really enjoyed it gave that a four stars it's at a 2.74 crazy next is gattaca one of my favorite science fictions of all time i've got that at a five stars but it's only a 377 i think that's a little bit of an underrated rating it's a very underrated and then 
Another one that's extremely underrating. We've sung his praise a bunch on this podcast. Richard Linklater's Boyhood. Have that at a five star. It only has a 3.28. A little bit crazy to me. Wow, I did um, not know that. That is crazy. I know. Like, that seems like a 4.0 or like a 4.2 4. or something. Yeah. I hold that as a top 10 movie of the, of the 2010s, and I did not think that was hot take one bit. It, it's, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, so I was shocked to see it here. But yeah, I guess Boyhood. And then Pursuit of Happiness, I also have five stars, but it's only got a 386. I understand it kind of plays into the same tropes of like the American dream, but I don't know. It's, it's really good. I enjoy it. Um, and then Perks, Perks of Being a Wallflower as well. Have that at five stars. It's only a 3.9. It's a fantastic book. It's a fantastic recreation. I fucking love that movie so much. And I then in the last so one. Much. Oh, it's going to go away. Oh, like... So for normal, you're what Oscar, you don't like Perks of Being a Wallflower? It, <clears throat> it's the cringiest film ever. I feel like that's the whole point, you know? Wait. It's like I didn't realize you didn't like that. Wait, what, what do you have with it? Yeah, what do you have it? Film to sit through. Um I think I'm looking to give it a high rating. I have it at a three. Oh, okay. Well, oh, I've got it at a five. Just so many cringy moments that ruin everything. Oh, it's so good. So, man. It's, so it's good. not. It's so painful to sit through. It is it's honestly it's awful. It. And the oh, there's so many good scenes too. Like uh and then the last one is Ferris Bueller's Day Off, an absolute five star. No idea how so, this has a three point two or a three or a three point nine. Crazy, like it <laughs> makes me mad. Actually, it makes me frustrated that people don't love Ferris Bueller's Day Off as much as I do. It's um, actually not that low of an average, though. I mean, it's easily a five star yeah. movie, but like three point nine is a solid average. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Especially for a comedy, too. Yeah, you're right. So. I guess that's I can't be too mad. And there's a big this. cult following. Like, it's got a lot of five stars, so. Yeah. That's why um, I can't then... the stats page, because if you've got to, like, a five, it's pretty much guaranteed to be here. Like, if that's it's not, true. like, four point something. Yeah. So that's, most of mine were movies I gave five stars that the rest of the population didn't think were that great. Um, but then my rated lower than average is a little bit more interesting. I've got Lovers Rock. We did a watch party of that. I give that a one and a half. It's a music video. Like, you cannot tell me otherwise. <laughs> I just wasn't, I wasn't vibing oh, with dude. it. It's got a 4.0. Like, how is it? I got a 4.0. No idea. Um, next movie is one we watched kind of recently for Christmas. Carol with Rooney Mara. I was just mm-hmm. relatively disinterested. Gave that a two. It's got a 4.0. Again, a better movie than Ferris Bueller's Day Off, allegedly. Um, and then I got another hot take. I got John Wick 4. I got that at a 2. It's got a 3.95. Another hot take, an Alfred Hitchcock movie, The 39 Steps, I've got at a 2. It's average at a 3.77. Think of films. No, it's not yeah, it's, it's so boring. It's not that great. It's so Bottom boring. Bottom of filmography. And it last, is. but certainly not least, Harold and Kumar Christmas Special. Gave that a good old <laughs> 1 star. It's got a 2.78. Now that's an L. That movie's fucking old. <laughs> um, i love the first one not the christmas special the first one's obviously a thousand times better but the christmas one's still a classic yeah to be honest um but for me my rated higher than average obviously tron legacy five stars um it has a 3.12 average which is absolutely criminal maybe too high that's criminal. <laughs> too yeah, high. Not too high. <laughs> Masterpiece. Um, Under the Silver Lake, I have a five stars as well. That's a 3.49 average, which is crazy. Um, Still A24's best film to date. People are on something. It's an incredible film. Um, Annihilation, I have a four and a half. Um, that's a 3.58. People hate on that film so much. I, the, the last act of that film is some of the most brilliant sci-fi this century so far. I think it's absolutely genius. Um, I didn't know you loved it that much. It is good, though. Annihilation, yeah. yeah. Uh, Alex Garland has since gone downhill, tragically. Um, yeah, between like that and Ex Machina, like, he was Too on top of sci-fi, sci-fi at the yeah. time. Incredible. And he's he's just moved away from that. Um, and I don't think Civil War looks that great either, to be honest. Um, the descent either a four and a half. That's it's a three point six one average. Um, one of the scariest hobbies ever, and I 
oddly love rewatching it, but it's really, really good. Um, Enemy as well, four and a half. One of A24's best, and it's a 3.65 average. Such an intriguing film, symbolically. Um, I kind of wish Dini uh, did another weird kind of film like that, because I think that one worked really, really well. Um, and then Nope as well, I've had a four and a half, which is just a 3.75 average. I don't think that's like a massively like rated higher than average thing. It's not really a hot take at all. Um, one of the best films of the decade, easily, for me. Um one of the best films of 2022 my rated low on average um to a lot of people's dismay i gave tokyo drift one star and it's a 3.0 average it's the worst fast and furious film it is painful to sit through no worst fast and worst. furious no way there's no way this film <laughs> that's crazy like i don't love it but worst fast and furious is nuts bro yeah trailer films this year i watched antichrist and gave it a one and a half um i would quite like to revisit it because i feel like my taste has changed since then but it it wasn't the best of experiences um i do like some i do like his weird stuff and i think he's a really fascinating filmmaker but that was it looks right <laughs> but <laughs> um, yeah is is a film it says a 3.4 average which is just kind of crazy but i do want to rewatch it um it was crazy mm -hmm. it's a camp since at a 3.7 average and i gave it two stars the most painfully unfunny film of the year i wanted to die watching that i don't know how people rated that so highly ryan have you what seen film? it well? the what film camp. oh oh uh, yeah I feel like if you like went to theater camp or something like that as a kid, I mean, you could really relate to it. Though. I think it's for a specific like group of people. Like, yeah, Oscar just I, isn't I, the theater kid. I did some stuff like that when I was younger, um, okay. but I just found it painfully unfunny. Really, really unfunny. Um, and then finally, I gave the French Dispatch two stars because it absolutely sucks. Um, Wes Anderson's worst oh. film by a man and absolute snooze fest. Um, and it's just a 3.7 average. another film that will be seen as a masterpiece in the future. It's, Thank you. Uh, I don't know if I can get that one. I don't know. It's so forgettable film. Like, I want to try and um, not... I want to try and like some of his films more. I do like some of them. But for me, this one, I, I, I'm standing on my hay on this one. Um, I I just don't like it at all. I, I think that's his weakest so many different forms of art brilliant craftsmanship brilliant storytelling it's one of the best and no timothy chalamet is a half star that film <laughs> yeah. that's an end let's move on <laughs> just filmed by a mile so that was our letterbox wrapped um oh, wait, did, let us know in the that. comments about yeah, your letterbox yeah, wrap yeah. oh i'm i'm so sorry ryan well <laughs> give me a chance here's wait, your first that, like, he's like and this guy <laughs> um, my higher rated than average is kind of boring I have the whole Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy inside it um, shouldn't be anywhere near this somehow Spider-Man 3 is a 2.98 rating I don't know what they're smoking but yeah um, meanwhile I, I also have two five stars and they don't come near my rated than high to high. Rated, high, rated higher than average because yeah that's funny I, any like in the twos that I've given five stars to <laughs> <laughs> that's what i mean uh, i think it means it's quite boring um another one um my first time re-watching theaters i uh, once upon a time in hollywood i managed to see that in 35 millimeters this year so that was that was probably one of my best theater watches of the year somehow i think that maybe tarantino's lowest rated film on Larabox, maybe it's a 3.76 that should be much higher um another one that is criminally um, underrated 3.82 nobody talks about it it's Babylon ooh, ooh. I, that should be much higher and then one that I rewatched for our Batman episode and Batman Forever at three and a half I don't even think that's like a hot take yeah, but it has like a 2.44 oh, rating it shouldn't be a hot take that's crazy yeah. that it's like on there like even though it's kind of like you didn't give it that hot of a score yeah it, I think it's got a really like low rating because I think people get confused with Batman Forever and Batman and Robin. Like, they just kind of club them in together. That's true. But yeah. 
Um, my rated lower than average. I am. Um, I also have Lovers Rock bad. by Steve McQueen. Um, a documentary about The Shining called Room Two Three Seven. I just thought that was one of the worst documentaries I've seen. Um, I give that one star. Um, oh, I, this is a hot take. I have, have Autumn Sonata, um, from Bergman, uh, a two and a half. Yeah. That is not very. That's, that's in the top thirty. Is that right? Yeah, it is. That's that's an embarrassment. The fact that look, I haven't done a deep dive into Bergman's filmography, but I watched yeah, Autumn right. Sonata, and I was not excited. I was not thrilled. I love Bergman, kind of but I it's don't. A I, it's it, it's all right. I don't it's hate it. But at the same time, it is probably Bergman's Bergman's most overrated film. It's it's, it's all right. Just put that there. there. It's no Fanny Alexander. Dude, I'm nowhere near ready to watch that. Yet. What was that? Ball out? I said Autumn Sonata can't hold Fanny Alexander's jockstrap. It's disrespectful to even put them in the same conversation. I'm so glad I got to see that in the first half of the the other week. It, 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 it turns into a horror film out of nowhere, and it's so good. A horror film? Check it out. Yeah, it's got major horror vibes to it. It's really, really good. Um, I also have just the random 80s horror that I watched during October at a one and a half and it has a it's called Dead and Buried um, I don't think anybody's seen it um, it has a three and a half um, rating and then my piping hot what should be piping hot take um, I have um, the worst film released this year um, Wonka <laughs> you don't believe that's the worst film released this year okay it's not the worst it, it's bottom 10 it's bottom 10 that's crazy that is cool. Wonka. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> What's the average rating for Wonka, and what did you give it, Ryan? It, I gave it one star as a, as a 3.42. That's actually quite low. 3.42 <laughs> is too low. It should be higher. It's No, that's, that's a, about that's fair. Than he had to find a way to express his Wonka hate in this episode. <laughs> yeah, it was coming. <laughs> I didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> okay that's all my my whole takes all right i guess now we get time we're gonna move into probably the most anticipated segment of this episode and that is our rankings uh from 10 we're gonna go 10 to 6 we'll go honorable mentions then 10 to 6 and then we will go one by one for our top five these are our top five favorite films. Uh, we might differ. Some of us separate best and favorite. Some of us don't. But this is simply our favorites. So feel free to let us know how you feel in the comments and how uh, you feel about ours, what you would have picked, and how much you agree or disagree with us. But who would like to start us off? I will. Start us off, Oscar. Okay. Um, before honorable entrance or anything, um, I live in the UK, so... I'm just going to say a few things that I have not seen that won't be on this list. So, um, uh, the holdovers I haven't seen, the Iron Claw I haven't seen, uh, All of Us Strangers, American Fiction, Perfect Days, Monster, um, all those I hope to be up there once I get around to seeing them, but I I have not seen them yet. Will be in the next coming months. And so, my honourable mentions. Um, I for me, I've got Bo is Afraid, um, The Killer. Ferrari, um, Society of the Snow, Killers of the Flower Moon, and Rice Boy Sleeps. Those are kind of my honorable mentions. Some really, really good films this year, but just outside of my top 10. Um, um, for me, in 10th place, I have a film that is getting, is surprising, well, not maybe not surprisingly, but it's quite polarizing from a lot of things that I've seen. I don't think any of you have seen it, but that is The Boy and the Heron. Um, lucky enough to attend the UK premiere of this. Um, I really, really liked it. I think it's such a beautiful combination of Miyazaki's work. And it, even though it's not going to be his last film, I think it feels like his last film. I know a lot of people thought it'd be, it was really disjointed, but I, I like that almost, uh, that kind of free nature that the, the film had and the exploration that we see of all these crazy kind of worlds and creatures, and animals that we see. And I had such a good time with this, um, and deserving of my 10th space. Um, in ninth, um, another film I was at the UK premiere for was May, December, um, has, I gave it a four initially. I still have it a four, but this film has grown 
on me a lot more. Um, I've moved up my ranking a lot. Um, and I think it's just such a fantastic um, commentary um, um, or all the boys and or, um like grooming and like groping because obviously it has a really kind of dark and heavy un um kind of undertones to it that i think a lot of people have, have missed honestly from what i've been seeing um but a uh, really really fantastic film and i think todd hayes is such a fantastic director um uh, it's a really really beautiful film and the performances are fantastic and specifically the writer i think um the writer of this film i think and like across like a lot of Todd Hayes, Hayes films are really, really good in the way that they kind of nuance themes. And I think this is a really thematically rich film that I think explores all those themes really, really, really well. So uh, another fantastic film this year. Um, in eighth place, I have Will's absolutely favorite film of the year and there's John Wick chapter four. Um, this, this is so cool, man. This is such an awesome film. I think like, People say this like like for an action film. This has, I think, the story is just so good. It has like a decent amount of lore behind it and backing that makes it really, really interesting. Not to mention, um, you just get amazing films when ex stuntmen direct films. We kind of see it with things like Extraction, but you have the Russo brothers writing those films, so that's not going to go well. But um, Charles Delcy is he's so so good as kind of helming these films and the direction that this takes is just so so impressive i think the runtime just flies by and uh i really really enjoyed it um in seventh for me i have anatomy of a fall um fantastic fantastic film maybe one of the strongest ensembles this year the performances are fantastic um best animal performance of the year the dog the dog was in like paid actor ridiculous ridiculous in this film um one of the best child performances of the year as well um Sandra Hiller has had an incredible year. Um, she puts in an, a, one of the best performances of the year for me. This narrative, kind of a lot of subtle hints to everything. It was really engaging. The runtime, like with John Wick, just flew by for me. And I thought the ending kind of left it open for interpretation, but in the best way possible, because I've, I've still been thinking about it since and absolutely deserving of my seventh spot. And then for me in sixth place, a film has gone down for me slightly um, this year, but still, still holds that top ten status is Spider Man across the Spider Verse. Um, kind of breaking through the rubbish superhero films that we had this year. We had this Shining Light, just some of the most unbelievable animation ever. I think the story is really, really strong, and I still don't get the the hate of like, oh, it's only half a story. Well, it's a part one. What else are they supposed to do, man? And I, I'm glad that um, they kind of left it this way. Um, I had high expectations for this, um, and it, it, I met those expectations perfectly, and I'm very excited for the um, for the conclusion of this story. Just uh, pay your VFX artists and treat them well, because it doesn't look like they have been, um, and I hope they take their time with it and don't rush it. Um, so yeah, that is my honourable mentions, and 10 through 6. Uh, Ryan, what about you? Yeah, just the same as what you said at the start, like, in the UK we have not got anything, so everything you said on top of Poor Things and Zone of Interest I have not seen, um, so they will not be on my list. But my honourable mentions are David Fincher's The Killer, um, Talk To Me, um, A Spider-Verse and Anatomy of a Fall. Um, but yeah, it's I think up here it's, it's, it's pretty stacked getting into the top 10. It, I've had to make a couple of eliminations that were tough. But in number 10, I have May December. Uh, I kind of discovered Todd Hayden's um, this year. Um, I wasn't aware, really aware of him at all before. And after watching Dark Waters and this, I it's quite clear how strong of a director he is. It's just one of those occasions for me when you know, like, instantly you're watching, like, a, you're like watching a proper movie, like, the, the direction, writing, acting, it's all on point, and you can just kind of sit back and enjoy the ride, because I think this is one of the more interesting screenplays of the year for me kind of like Oscar was saying it blends a lot of like genres and stuff into the screenplay and it does a get, good job of giving you a mix of a lot of stuff and I think all three lead performances are some of the best of the year um, and I think they all should be nominated they were all very good it's a, a, a very solid film I have this a, a four or five for my attempt spot uh, my number nine I have the biggest surprise of the year I have Godzilla minus one it's I I imagine saying some or someone saying that a Godzilla movie was going to be the, like one of the best films of the year at the start of the year that you would not believe them 
Like it's they've not only perfected like the, the the action side, but they've also provided like this really emotional and human Godzilla film. And I, I don't think I've seen that from really any other monster film of recent times. You don't really care about the humans ever, especially in the like American version and the monster universe. In fact, you're usually rooting for the humans to die, but in this one, like the human aspect is probably the strongest part of the film as you like really care about what happens to the protagonist and like his whole family. It's a film that like we were saying earlier completely exposed like how much money is just being wasted in like Hollywood productions as they were able to do this for fifteen million um dollar fifteen million dollars, which is just insane. And it's a huge win for international cinema, kinda of making its way into mainstream audiences view. So this is a, another high four out of five. I've I haven't stopped thinking about this since I've seen it, so it's probably gonna go up whatever you watch, but it sits at number nine for now. At number eight, I've got a release from the earlier on in the year, Bo's Afraid. It's probably, it, it, I get his, I would ask his worst film, but that's not really saying much because I think he is one of the best directors working there now. And it's, yeah, it's still a great film. But yeah, it's, it's, a very, it's a very unique film. It's probably the most polarizing film released this year. Like, yeah, it, get, it takes a lot of risks and I think most of it works um, pretty well. And it's quite cool that just even stuff like this getting made, like directors like we're saying are getting these big budgets to kind of do their passion projects. And yeah, I, I just really loved, uh, I, I love anything that Arias does. So I think this was maybe a 24 biggest win of the year, even though they lost a lot of money, but I loved it. It was a high four, four out of five again. Um, number seven, I have John Wick again. Um, sorry, Will, it's... It is the best guys franchise for me. These guys suck. <laughs> it is. It's just an excellent display of action choreography. It's. I mean, I think Chad Stahelski's kind of showed that he is a really solid action director there now. And there's a lot of the moments in this film are like some of my favorite moments of the year, like that overhead Hotline Miami sequence. I know, Will, you were saying you hated that, but I guess so good. Like that- the the stair sequence, it, it, I think the stair sequence is like a brilliant like moment of like physical comedy. Like that is mm-hmm. honestly like one of the most funniest scenes of the year. Yeah, because the film's a joke, dude. <laughs> <laughs> hey, old boy, will because there's like that scene where it like takes out the wall with that fight scene. Yeah, I hate that scene. That the, that that hallway scene is god what awful, dude. It breaks the, the illusion I'm meeting. The, most, the yeah, best like, action scene. That, that really scene is one. Of, uh, that is just what I'm about to say. It's one of the greatest action scenes ever. That old boy. That's, you, that's what the phone will tell you. Ferris Bueller. Like you're literally redeeming Ryan's Ferris Bueller rating by saying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree on this one. Mm. I, I I do think the shouts of it being the greatest action film of all time are a bit overblown. Like The Matrix is still Keanu Reeves' best film for me, and I, I don't see I mean, that ever being beaten. Uh, yes, it, it's still a great film though. I don't know what you're on about. <laughs> Two stars. It's outrageous. <laughs> But yeah, it, do you know even like this the cinematography like the, the colors no i, I think like, it's, it's just it's, generally generally weak i don't know like it's there's a total cinematographer like it, it's the colors are beautiful like it's it so is, good. yeah there, there are some nice shots like the this location's great like there are some really cool locations and some really nice shots but i don't know like all in all like i don't think the cinematography lends to the story all that well like it's kind of just floating around in space as john wick just mows down people time and time again Extremely repetitive in almost every facet of this Weird. the film. Let us know <laughs> if you guys want to see a John Wick full breakdown episode. <laughs> Please don't. I'll actually have to watch all of them. Yeah, I actually don't because I don't want to watch them. Yeah. Wait, Alex, if you don't see that. I saw the first one. I liked it at all, and I just never cared to watch the rest. I've heard good things about the fourth, and maybe I would actually like it. I just no. But I'm at home and can pick any movie I want all around the world. I'm not going to pick John Wick too. Facts, Alex. Spitting facts. Your your job is safe on the Shot by Shot podcast. <laughs> I'm not Crazy. the one who heard the hallway scene from Old Boy. Arguably the greatest action sequence ever was was bad. So <laughs> just. Okay, well, yeah. a lot of people love John Wick, so I'm clearly in the minority. You guys are allowed to love yeah. John Wick, all right? Mm-hmm. Okay, and finally, my number six, I have The Holdovers. It's just, it, it feels like a film that was released like 30 years ago, and they just finally released it. 
it's a it's just a charming hilarious incredibly like well acted film that i think it's already a holiday holiday classic for me i'll be watching it every year um again just filled with some of the best performances of the year um, especially um dominic sessa it's crazy that this was his first performance um yeah and i i think all of them should be like up there um for nominations for the oscars maybe even winning a, a couple of oscars but yeah i'm very excited to see this in theaters when it finally gets released in the uk in 20 years um because i think it'll be a very good theater, theater watch yeah that's my that's my 10 to 6 what is your number 10 pretty good, pretty good 10 to 6 yeah i think you'll really enjoy the holdovers in the theater i think like the set design of it like it really immerses you you do feel like you're in the 70s um, but okay, I'll start with some of my honorable mentions, probably some films we've already talked about, but this year I really enjoyed Priscilla. I thought that was a great, um, kind of rebound off Elvis. I didn't like it. It was kind of like Elvis was kind of like fast food. Like it was kind of, you eat it. It's like gross. There's too much of it. You feel like shit after. Whereas Priscilla is like steak and wine. You eat it. It sits with you. You think about it. Um, so I much preferred Priscilla. I thought that was a great movie. Another honorable there mention, May, December. What's that? I said, there you go, redeeming yourself for your old Okay, people. all right, nice. <laughs> Thank um, rating, and, and, yeah. And then May, December, we, Ryan kind of touched on it briefly. I think it's one of the sharpest scripts of the year, and every single performance is perfect. Um, so it's my 12 and 11, Iron Claw. Really, really good, really emotional. I didn't love it as much as some people, but still definitely really great, uh, high up on my list. But now I can get into my top 10. Uh, the 10 spot, I got Poor Things by Yorgos Lanthimos. I really, really enjoyed this. I know the uh, UK guys, well, at least Ryan, he hasn't seen it yet, but I'll give you my spoil th spoiler-free thoughts. It's just kind of like surreal enough where it's fun and fresh, but it's also tied into reality where you can coherently piece together a story with characters that are seemingly real. Um, but it's still really cool, kind of a twist on the Frankenstein tale. At number nine, I got The Holdovers. Uh, again, I thought this was really good, really clean, sharp script, great performances. One of those films that just fires on all cylinders. Just like a wholesome Christmas watch, like Ryan said. I can see myself revisiting this every year uh, during the winter. It's just like a staple winter movie for me now, I guess. At number eight, we talked about it briefly earlier in the episode, Asteroid City. I think this is a fantastic film, and the fact that people are sleeping on it so hard um, it's kind of sad to me. I think the ensemble cast kind of worked perfectly here. And it's so meta. Like, it's a play within a play. Like, I just love everything about it. It just screams Wes Anderson. Um, and, of course, extremely well acted. I think Jason Schwartzman has had an extremely underrated year. He's done a lot of great big roles, small roles. So I'm going to sing his praise quick uh, with Astrid City at 8. At number 7, I got David Fincher's The Killer. When Fincher's dropping, his chances are his film's going to be on my top 10. I love him as a director, but I have to say I was a little bit underwhelmed with Killer. Um, my expectations were so sky high that I was expecting a movie of the year type thing. Um, but I still have it in the 7th spot. Definitely a nice little uh, neo-noir with some homages to some really great films of the past. And then in my 6th spot, I got Anatomy of a Fall. This might be my favorite international film of the year. It was just really sharp script and... I'm someone who really loves a good script and good characters who you can relate to and kind of get lost in. And I think that's exactly what Anatomy of Fall is. It's such a deceptive, winding tale, but it's just fresh. Like, it's, it's, there's nothing like it that I've seen this year. It's just a really good script, really good screenplay. I definitely check it out if you get the chance. Um, so, yeah, that was my 10 to 6. Kind of similar to some of the other guys, but for a reason, some good films coming out this year. Alex? Yeah, my list is going to be a little different. Keep in mind, these are my favorite films. I'm purely factoring what I like the best, not what I necessarily consider the best films. So to breeze through, I'll breeze through my honorable mentions with my 15 to 11. Uh, starting us off, Iron Claw. Great sports movie. I think this is like the first, and we're really seeing of A24 doing familiar name movies with a kind of wrestling as a huge fan base in itself. And... It's uh, definitely helping them make some money back at the end of the year. I thought it was a very good sports film, very emotional. I enjoyed that one. Number 14, other honorable mention, Guardians of the Galaxy 3, one that every time I think about it, I question if I should have it higher. If I saw it, you know, maybe three years ago, it would definitely be a lot higher, and I would have appreciated it a lot more. 
I'm actually surprised how many blockbusters made it onto this list, because normally a lot of them don't. But Guardians of the Galaxy 3 is so hopeful for comic book movies. It's uh, It shows that not not a return to form for Marvel, but a nail in the coffin for Marvel, because James Gunn's going to go to DC and absolutely put them in the dirt. And it's one of the best uses of music in any comic book movie, one of the best uses of music of the year with a dynamite soundtrack. Then we got Raisuki Hamaguchi, who is one of my favorite and I think one of those interesting new directors right now. He did Drive My Car, which I absolutely loved in 2021. He did Evil Does Not Exist, which I know most people haven't gotten to see yet. I was blessed to see it at a film festival, and it's, I don't know how everyone's going to feel about it, but it was just a very meditative film that I enjoyed a lot. Number 12 just recently uh, fell off of my top 10 and really hurts me to, to that it's no longer my top 10 because I liked it a lot, and that is Priscilla. I thought Priscilla was a great film. It just had so much style, the hair, the makeup, the wardrobe, did a phenomenal job with. But most importantly, just the amount of storytelling that's done with just the faces of the actors and uh, a, a phenomenal lead performance. And it's a great soundtrack, and uh, it's, I don't want to spend too much time talking about an honorable mention, but I have so much that I would love to say about it. And that is my final honorable mention. It really hurts me to move this off of my top 10. It was a very tough decision because I do like this film a lot, and that is Yorgos Lanthimos' Poor Things, which I think is a great film, and it's definitely one of the best movies of the year, and it is better than multiple films in my top 10. And... I just think it's your ghost's best direction of the year. <laughs> Fake. It's just the yeah. differentiation between favorites and best. Like I, it's so hard. Like I, when I remember I'm making the top ten list, it's that. just yeah. I for me, it, it makes no sense. Like I don't get it. Different states uh, of mind. I don't. I can't think that way. That's that something for another episode it's it's yeah, a very well crafted movie i don't want to get into a whole tangent on it especially with a film in my honorable mention but it's a film that is deserving of top 10 spot it's uh, i love the surrealism obviously emma stone all the performances are great but emma stone gives maybe the best performance all around of the decade and one of the best performances i've ever seen in my life and should surely be winning her second oscar this year uh, great score use. It's, it's not a type of score I'm going to listen to in my own time, but it's so unique and full of different instruments that fits so well in the storytelling of the film. And it's uh, it's the reason why I've ended up bumping it out is because it's uh, because uh, it's a film I've seen it three times in theaters already, and I'm definitely going to see it once more. We do an episode on it, and then probably a fifth in theater watch right before the Oscars. So it's obviously a film that I enjoy very much. I'm going to see it that many times. However, I think that once its theater runs over and the Oscars is over, I don't really see myself revisiting it revisiting it in the future unless I decide to do a binge through Yorgos' filmography or it gets a screening, you know, five plus years down the line. So because I don't see myself rewatching it as much as some of the ones above it is, is was, was the top deciding factor to move it out of the top 10, even though it's a great film. Now, starting us off at number 10, let's get a drum roll going. Go on. Be only. You know it's coming. Super Mario Brothers. Oh, that's Mario disaster. Brothers is a dead fucking banger. Okay? This film is... That's not a banger. That's not a banger. <laughs> that's not a banger. I know bangers, and that's not a banger. <laughs> if I bought 10 films this year. I'm telling you why Mario Brothers is great. I listen to some garbage <laughs> films on the rest of your list. You're going to listen to talk about Mario Brothers. <laughs> Here's why that movie is fun. That movie is, it's everything. It's, it's listen, Mario, I was a Mario Brothers fan growing up. I played the video games. Mario as a franchise was always about gameplay and experience over story and character, like some of the other video game franchises. And they are so true to that with this movie. It's not loyal to the rules of screenwriting or the rules of storytelling that we think when we go into watching a movie. And what it really is about is not about telling a story. It's about immersing you in this world which is some of the most beautiful animation we've ever seen such an incredibly cool world that you would want to live in and creating an experience within that world and you know traveling from place to place like you do in a video game and i don't think it captures what we think of when we think of you know a great movie like a great storytelling movie i think it's it, it is more loyal to what a video game is than what a traditional screenplay is and i think a lot of video game movies try and put the video game into this traditional movie screenplay format and they suffer because of that 
for this film just embrace what the franchise is with, you know, creating an immersive world and fun experiences in those worlds. And it's definitely, listen, Scorsese talks about these movies like their theme park. And that is absolutely what this is. This is a theme park experience movie, but I think it's so good at that. And it's loyal to what the, the IP is. And it's very, just an immersive, fun experience that, you know, I can just watch this movie again and again. It's, is it turn your brain all fun? Yes. Like poor things is a movie where my brain's on, I'm thinking and stuff like that. This is a turn your brain off dumb movie, and I enjoy every minute of it. And because I could rewatch it endlessly, that's why it's on this list. If you disagree with me, feel free to hate in the comments. I don't care. If they have nothing to like it, go fuck yourself. Anyway, number nine, which was the real decider between poor things. I knew I wasn't leaving Mario Brothers off the list. So number nine is the film that did take Poor Things' spot because it is just such a... And I also partially because I didn't think that this would be on anyone else's list because I don't think anyone else has got the chance to see this, but it's an incredible gem of this year, and that is Hirokazu Koreeta's film Monster. And Koreeta is a great Japanese director who's worked in some other Asian countries. Like, he did a film in South Korea last year called Broker, which was a great film great last film. year. And yeah, great, great film. So oh, much more past years he's had so many highly acclaimed films that i want to see more because i really love broker and i'm really excited for monster i'm definitely going to get around to that when it comes out here in march yeah he's i think he's one of the great uh filmmakers working right now and he's not someone who i like kind of very the flashier cinematography personally he's not that type of filmmaker he's much but he has just such a deep human element to all of his stories and they're full of so much heart and I don't want to say too much because I know not a lot of people have seen it and it's hard to talk about this film without spoiling things. But he uses the Rashomon effect, which is storytelling from different characters' perspectives and how different they are. So beautifully in just a unique way the story unfolds. And just this kind of lack... It's a story about there's an incident at a, a grade school and it's you have kind of the, the, how the teacher sees it, how the mother sees it, and how the kids see it. And you really understand the lack of the full story and... You know, like I said, like how difficult it is to really find what the truth is of the situation. And the truth of the situation is very different from what the beginning of the film is going to lead you to believe. So uh, it's very hard to really say anything about this film without spoiling it for people. But it's one that if it plays near you, I highly recommend you see because I think it's one of the great films of this year from one of the great storytellers working today. Number eight, I have a film that is the only one where it's in my top 10 in a kind of disappointing way because I thought for sure this would be my number one. And just by me saying that, I think everyone knows that that means it is Killers of the Flower Moon, which was by far my most anticipated film of the year. Martin Scorsese, it's, I can't even put the words, the admiration I have for him as a, as a filmmaker and an artist and just all around. This is literally my idol in life. And every time he makes a film, I have so much excitement. And I do still think this is a brilliant film. I think he's still such an insanely brilliant storyteller on so many levels. And like I've talked about, oh my, I, I really don't need to say much. We've done a full episode. If you want my opinions on the film, there's a lot of praise I give to it in that episode. He's brilliantly uses the juxtaposition scenes to tell his story and the way he does it through subtly because the event that the film is portraying is such a subtly uh, executed tactics in the way that the characters in that film do what they do and Scorsese takes that same subtlety to his filmmaking which is it's it's a brilliant film however when I'm going through Scorsese's filmography it's not necessarily in the top tier it's not one that I'm going to rewatch over a lot of his other films but it is still a brilliant film and definitely one of the best of this year number seven a film that was was in my top five for a little bit and I really uh did love it a lot and that is Bradley Cooper's Maestro I know some many of you weren't as high one as I am. Bradley Cooper, I'm a little biased. Everyone knows he's my favorite actor, and uh, it just yeah, obviously he's a Philly guy. I I have that bias there because it's a very big deal for me to see another Philly guy achieve success like that. But aside from that bias, I think that as an actor, he's arguably the best at choosing roles. Like look at his filmography and the projects he chooses to work on, and the directors he chooses to work with like he's very calculated about who he works with and has such a great body of work as an actor because of that now that we see him moving into as a director i think he's treating it with that same approach with six years of preparation into this and bringing us such a specific direction i think is easily one of the best directions of the year and i just really love the way he told the story even though i wish that 
he used more music, especially with being a composer mo movie, I think that it's just such a brilliant direction from one of my favorite artists in the industry, and I, I really did enjoy it so much, and I'm excited to talk more about it once we eventually do that. And then my number six, a film that was lower on my list for a while, because even though I enjoy it so much, it's I don't think it's the best script. I think the script is a lot weaker because it's a kid's movie script. However, the ad adaptation of that kid's movie script is brilliant, and this is Across the Spider-Verse, which is just full of absolute unhinged creativity and just uh, such varieties of an variety of animation styles, and it's just so beautiful, all the different animations. And it's I, my big criticism of the Marvel movies more than anything is how a comic book is a series of, of painting of images and every image is meticulously crafted to where the point where like I would do as a kid because I hated to read you can just flip through a comic book and look at the pictures and understand the story. And I've always hated how Marvel movies never take that approach to their storytelling with images that don't matter. And this is the true showcase. I mean, the first one was too, but these films are a true showcase of real comic books brought into the cinematic art and it's just a, one of the greatest accomplishments in comic book movies so that is my 10 to 6 oscar what is your number five so for me my number five has already been mentioned but um definitely one of the biggest surprises of the year in the best way possible because japanese cinema like alex has been saying has had such a fantastic year as a whole and I haven't even seen like some, some of the big ones that i really want to do so i've got godzilla minus one and number five um on the um, this year like going into i hadn't really cried in many years watching films um i cried several times watching films this year and this is absolutely one of them um and like going into i'd never thought a godzilla film would bring me this way i like what's already been mentioned like in the american um godzilla films we we, we just don't want to see the the characters at all the human characters the most boring annoying things the scripts are awful and they just get on your nerves so so much this this post-war setting was absolutely brilliant you feel the emotions of so many characters and that uh, especially in kind of some of the final scenes that just made me just broke me completely um but beyond that i think the godzilla design is fantastic just the sheer level of destruction that this film brought was absolutely unreal that kind of atomic breath scene is one of my favorite favorite scenes of the year i would have loved to have seen that in imax but i didn't get the chance to but even still um it still took my breath away um with kind of the risks it took in kind of what it meant for the film and i really really enjoyed that um so yeah it's such a such a special film and i'm so happy it exists because probably my favorite godzilla film honestly but i would really really like to go back and um uh see all the originals because i haven't actually had the chance to do so but yeah the the Japanese definitely need, need to be the only ones making Godzilla films because they're, they're the only ones who can do it correctly, as it seems. Yeah, literally. In the, in the lead up Godzilla to the, going up. In, the, in the lead up to Godzilla, I was watching some of the Godzilla movies. And uh, I, Alan and I in the Real Talk Discord, we watched Shin Godzilla and then the OG Godzilla. And yeah, yeah, obviously yeah, minus fantastic. one. I just, I just want to say that. I know you yeah. rated it not as high. But those are just those Godzilla movies are far and away better than any type of Godzilla movie that's come out of Hollywood. Like so, so much better. So you're totally right when you say that the Japanese made Godzilla films are better because they just are. They're just superior. Yeah. Leave Godzilla. It's crazy. Don't know what you're doing. It's it's a Japanese franchise. Leave it to Japan. Yeah. You don't know what you're doing. <clears throat> the American ones are like turn your brain off. Like I just want to see monkey hit giant lizard would <laughs> yeah but <laughs> but i can't turn my brain off because the human characters are so annoying yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not turn your brain off in a good way because like i need to turn my brain on to look at my watch to know how much longer I have <laughs> and the 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 trailer for the new one looks absolutely horrendous it does i i played before my godzilla showing and it just made it look oh. even worse oh, this is i think it looks dreadful yeah, so if you're watching this podcast and you haven't seen any Godzilla movies, start with minus one. Like, just jump straight to minus one. It's probably the best Godzilla movie out there. So, glad it's included in your guys' top ten. All right, Ryan, you want to... My turn? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um. So, yeah, going forward, these are all, like, 4.5 and up. Like, these are, like, some of my favorites of the decade going forward. 
Um, so the, the top of 20, 2023 is really strong for me. This is this is one that I watched last night, actually. It's called Race Boy Sleeps. Probably, it, it's went extremely under the radar um, just for the whole year. Um, Will kind of brought me onto this. I, it was on my watch list, but I hadn't had the motivation to watch it. I didn't realise it was that good. Um, but yeah, this is, like Oscar was saying, like, you haven't cried in a movie like th this completely this got me like as hard as like after something gets you the first time you watch it like um this is like a it's a movie about like a single mother who moves to to canada with her son after the death of like her husband and it just kind of explores like the troubles of being a single mother like adapting to new surroundings in a new country like and, and learning to like kind of accept your culture as well and it's just the performances are amazing like it's both of their first like feature films which is just crazy to think and i think it's kind of the directorial debut from the director like i looked on airbox and he had the film before this but it only had 50 people that watched it so i'm not really sure what happened with that so i'm just gonna kind of count it as his first film but yeah it, the direction is phenomenal it's like a, a lot of like long takes like not a lot of editing like it's a very like meticulously like shots like there's no coverage at all, so like really make it like a like meditative like experience kind of like you're kind of just like observing like the the mom and son as they kind of go through this journey of life, and it, it's just a, it's such a good film. Like it completely broke me. I I don't know if I was in like a certain mood or something like last night. Like the moment we like join him and he like starts. Well, this isn't spoilers. Like he's like starts his first day of school, and the start of film, and I was just endlessly holding back tears just seeing this little. Um, like boy, like I don't even know what it was with it, about it. It just, it just impacted me like so emotionally. But yeah, it's 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 one of the best of the year. Um, it's maybe even up there in the decade for me. I, I liked it that much. It's definitely the biggest surprise. It's a a four point five out of five in my number five of the year. I have not that's heard a, that one. But I'm excited to check it out. Yeah, Ryan, that's a that's a really good pick because my number film. Now, my number five film of 2023 is also Rice Boy Sleeps. <laughs> nice. And I'm just going to echo everything you have to say because, boy, this film is crazy. Like, Ryan absolutely is totally right. It hits you emotionally so hard. And I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the single mother. But there, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of elements that play on your emotions here. But there are just, like, three or four times where you're just, like, kind of sitting there. And it's very fly on the wall. Like, I said in my review, it's similar to, like, After Sun, Minari, like those kind of like plotless, fly on the wall, human experience films. But I love that. Like that is like one of my favorite genres of film. And this is like falls right into that realm. But it's just so meditative. And these camera shots are so pure. Like you're just kind of peering in on the relationship. You're just kind of watching it as it unfolds. Um, and then there's a location shift at the from one half to the second half. And gorgeous photography. Like in both settings, they get the most out of what they're trying to do. So, and again, the performances, like child performances... May, this is the year of child performances, I guess. Like May, December, and Rice Boy Sleeps, two very heavy roles that are carried by children. Um, but yeah, I, Ryan kind of summed it up perfectly. Um, sorry, what's that? Anatomy of a Fall, a great child performance. In, yeah, yeah, Anatomy of a Fall. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's just the year of kid performances. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, but a really great film, and I definitely go check it out. But you, it is kind of like... A, it is meditative, but you got to kind of be in the right mood for it. It's a slow burn. Like it's, it's definitely a different film, um, but it's my fifth number five film of the year. I was truly exceptional and I absolutely adored it. Shout out Canada. <laughs> the plot, atmosphere and slice of life. I'm going to love this movie. Yeah. Yeah. I think you will. I think you will too. I think the middle of it for me was, yeah, I think it's a bit weaker. Um, I kind of got a bit detached, but I think that the beginning is really, really, really strong, and the ending is really, really, really strong. Um, I but yeah, but I gave I gave it a four. Yeah, I gave it a four and a half, same as Ryan. All right, Alex, what's your number five? My number five. So my number five is actually a film that I saw yesterday. It is uh, officially the hidden gem of 2023. It's a film that greatly changed my view on this as a film year because i kind of been looking for a film like this something just unexpected that really blew me away and it's similar i know uh, none of i'm guessing most people watching haven't seen it and i know oscar's the only one here who has seen it and it's kind of like we just mentioned with slice of life atmosphere not a lot of plot and that is fallen leaves which is a film that came out of finland and is 
I think easily one of the, the best films I saw this year. It's ultra European in its style. It's not going to be a film for everyone. It's uh, it's definitely it's very it's a lot of quiet and really great powerful music moments where they just let the music carry, which I love. But even in the scenes in between the music, it's just very much like just taking in the sounds of life and very still moments with small movements. And it's just such like a, a deeply human film where you're just kind of existing in the world of these characters and their daily routine and lives on a kind of a more just realism human level, but in a quieter, more meditative way, which I just love so much. And easily some of the, the best cinematography of the of the year. And uh, it just does such a great job of just the scale of everything within the frame to, to make it have such like a heightened impact. And some of the just the strongest images that I've seen this year by, by a mile. And it, it's especially the film where it's like we think of good cinematography and we think of like these epic shots, like stuff like Godzilla Minus One. Whereas this is very just like a small, intimate life film about like a very intimate story about these two characters. And yet the cinematography is as good as anything else we've seen this year. Arguably, could even arguably be the best. And yeah, it's kind of like After Sun, not to compare it to After Sun, which is arguably the best film of the decade. But where towards the end of the year, it was like this late, small discovery that I didn't know would even exist. And it's just I really ended up loving. I'm not saying it is as good as After Sun, but just kind of had that same effect on me at the end of the year. And... Yeah, there's just so many things I could say about it. It's totally the type of film I like. It's uh, such a great human story about these two characters and the world they live in and just a, a great atmosphere of slice of life that I enjoyed so very much. So I highly recommend if you're into films like that to check out Fallen Leaves if uh, it gets plays in one of the theaters near you or when it hits streaming, if not. Yeah, Alex, when I saw your review for that, I was ecstatic. I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. Like, this kind of came out of nowhere. And then just hearing you describe it now, it kind of does sound like After Sun or Rice Boy Sleeps, like just comes on late, but nobody kind of knows a lot about it, but it's just a really poignant film. So I'm really excited to check it out because I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, I can't wait. Like, like this style is definitely definitely something unique kind of when I saw that London Film Festival, I think I'd heard like one or two things about it. So I kind of I, I had like an empty slot that's that, that night after Killers of Five Minutes, so I was, I was kind of like, oh, I'll just go see what the next thing is on that night um, in the in the main area of the festival. So I I booked that and I'm gala dig because I really, really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, the tone was definitely a surprise to me, but I really dug it. And the, the comedy was really, 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 really funny and worked really well for me, but yeah. Um, uh, yeah, f oh, wait, we, wait. Was somebody after Alex, or am I? Am I? Am Look, I going before? You asked for number four. So, number four for me, and my last of my four and a halfs, um, is a film that we in the UK had to wait quite a few months for. Um, but when it got around, absolutely up there, one of my favorite films of the year. I have seen it twice now. Um, I definitely want to watch it again, and that is Past Lives. Um, a film that just works on so many levels. I love just these walking romances. You, we've kind of seen it with the before, surely before, before, uh, before just walking and talking romances that is so dialogue rich and thematically brilliant, and somehow just bring on so much emotion by round uh, by the end. Um, I think one of the most underappreciated scores of the year as well. Absolutely fantastic. Um, incredible directorial debut, like we said before. There's been so many fantastic up-and-coming female directors, and I think Celine Song is absolutely going to be one of them. Um, uh, incredible direction in this. Um, Greta Lee's performance was absolutely brilliant in this. Um, I hope, uh, I think she, I think she has a few projects lined up and I hope she gets a lot more because I thought she was brilliant in this. Um, the duality in this film works so, so well. There's some e easily multiple shots in this film, the shots of the year, those, that one of the, the stairs going up on the right and then just that leading on the left in the, um, streets of Seoul, I think it was, um, they kind of, the last scenes, um, emotionally destroyed me um and yeah i'm glad it's kind of been i'm I'm almost glad a24 picked this up because i feel like it that for that reason has been brought more into the spotlight this year and it's what a lot of people's favorite films of the year and i've got um a lot of people have recognized that because i absolutely love this and will continue to rewatch it and continue to be destroyed because i think 
it works on so many levels and yeah kind of reminds me of la la land kind of the relationship wise a bit but um yeah i just just such a such a brilliant film for me yeah ryan what is your number four my number four is also past lives this was a, a very hard decision as well because after watching rage boy sleeps last night i've just been thinking about whether it should go above past lives or in that fifth spot because i think i've been thinking about it and there's a lot of like themes that are similar to both of them um they're both about like uh someone immigrating from south korea and south korea to um canada which is weird so there's a lot of like connections with there so it was a, it was very hard to choose but i went with past lives because of decided to not go with the recency bias i uh, just went for the safe pick but yeah this is such a great debut from Celine song like uh I think hopefully she, she may be winning a, a Best Division screenplay now and the Barbie's gone. I really hope that happens and Greta Lee is still one of my favourite actresses um, from this year. But it's just, yeah, it's it's one of the best romance films we've got in a long time. It was, like, it's up there with like La La Land or maybe even since the before trilogy, like it, it's that good. It's just, yeah, it's, like just everything Oscar was saying, it's just such a well-made film, the score is amazing. All the performances are great. It's still one of my favourites from the, the year and the decade. Yeah, I love it. Well, Good pick. Uh, I'm going to break the uh, the pattern here. My number four is Killers of the Flower Moon by Martin Scorsese. Um, this was... Alex and I have a little bit of differing opinions on this one. Um, I really enjoyed this. I thought this was kind of on the top or top third of Scorsese's filmography. I kind of feel like it's kind of an amalgamation of everything he's done up to this point, kind of a theme that we've seen in 2023 with Oppenheimer, Asteroid City, just about everything. <laughs> uh, these directors kind of looking back at their career and reflecting on their skills and talents and really embellishing it. Um, Killers of the Flower Moon, no different. Like, fantastic performances, great script, extremely well-directed, just like every Martin Scorsese movie. You know what you're getting yourself into when you come into this. Um, but... An unexpected factor of this film that I had no idea was Lily Gladstone, and she might be my favorite actress pick of the year. She has such a powerful performance and just kind of reinvents this character from like a book that was kind of based on a similar thing, but Scorsese kind of threw it out and reinvented this as a relationship and a love story. So that works really well for me, that aspect between Lily Gladstone and Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, just a really good film. One of those that fires on all cylinders. And I, I just can't praise it enough because I'm eager to rewatch it. It's not one of those that like has a ton of rewatchability considering its length. Um, but there's just so much in here that I feel like there's to unpack. So I definitely want to revisit in this year and, and see if it climbs up this list because I could see it going up, quite frankly. It is a really good film and it, I've been thinking about it a lot, especially since I, I first watched it. So yeah, that's my number four of the year. Yeah, I do like to see it that high on your list because it is a great film, and I do think it deserves uh, that level of praise. And obviously, the performances from the entire leading trio is top tier, incredible. And uh, although I do think that The Irishman was his film that was the culmination of his whole career, whereas I think this was very much him kind of trying a different style to it. But uh, moving on, the uh, my number four is a film that just kind of was actually a little bit lower for a bit, and just the more I think about it, kept go it kept going up and. It's a film that I saw early in the year, and it's one that, as I saw a lot of those other films that were disappointing me, I just kept going back to the fact that even though this film has its flaws and some things I don't love, that its direction is just so insanely elite tier, and it's a film that just the more I think about it, I realize it is one of the best films of the year, and that is Ari Aster's Bo is Afraid, and... I think that this is easily one of, if not maybe even the best direction of the year. I talked about, you know, I think it has its flaws, and that really is just the third act when, uh, or I won't say what it is because in case anyone's in stand, but the third act I think really comes, the, the filmmaking kind of changes and it becomes kind of drags on a bit and it becomes more coveragey. But I mean, Ori Aster is a, a director who never uses coverage, so when he uses it, there, there's definitely an, a calculated reason for it. And uh, I think he has his reasons for making those decisions he made in the third act, even if I think it brings the film down a bit. But one of the best directions, it's so purely cinematic with its visual storytelling and so many extended sequences of just no dialogue. And whether it's the music, sound, or just the actions of the character telling the story, it's a 
such a showcase of such a range of directing styles and using all different cinematic tools and everything this art form has to offer to tell his story on such an elite level. Just like his mastery of just where to draw the eye in the frame and just the motions within the frame, the speed of every motion is just so precise. And obviously, you know, I, I just, I love surrealism and this is a very surreal movie. It reminded me of some things from Fellini in a lot of ways, like definitely has, I see some eight and a half in it. And it's, it's a film that I think more than anything else this year, with the exception of maybe one or two films, you could tell came from such a deep personal place from who made it. You could tell this is very kind of therapeutic to Ari Aster for, uh, in his direction. And I really like that, how he just brings so much of himself unapologetically and to a degree that he's probably even a little embarrassed by how much of himself he brings to this film, which I just have a tremendous amount of respect for and love seeing films that come from such a deep intuitive place like this one, which I think is brings probably his best direction yet, even though, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's the best directed film, I think for sure. And, uh, yeah, just one that I just keep, the more I think about it, the more I like it, I'm sure it's going to go up on every rewatch. And yeah, Ari Aster is one of the best work in the, today. It's kind of his career suicide film, like Chazelle's Babylon last year, but those are the films that stand the test of time in history. So who gives a shit? He'll make another hit, and then they'll they'll trust him again. So this was Ari Aster. You've proven yourself. We will fund anything you do. So he just made the film he wanted to make, and that's this, and I couldn't be happier with the product. So that is my number four. Very, very nice. And moving into top three now, and my three five stars of the year. Honestly, all pretty close together, but I have settled on this for now. So in my number third spot, um, I have Oppenheimer, um, and I know it's just number three, but I just cannot praise it enough. By and far, Christopher Nolan's best film. I've seen it four times, all four in cinemas this year. Um, it's just an unbelievable film, unbelievable film on kind of the scale that it's on and what it manages to achieve from a technical perspective. It's by far his best directed film, his best written film. Um, the use of the black and white, the subjective versus the objective, I think is absolutely brilliant. Though we discussed this um, in our very first Barbenheimer episode, um, that was really, really good. Um, one the best ensemble of the year for me in uh, in terms of performances wise. Obviously, so many big names, but I think they all produce very, very well. And I think it's really unfortunate because there's so many incredible supporting performances in this film that are just going to. Uh, can come get nothing but just because there's so many of them um obviously killian murphy for me still puts on the best performance of the year and his career best as well just so captivating um in this lead role the best score of the year as well i have it on vinyl i've been i listen to it every day can you hear the music was my most listened to song on spotify this year and ludwig goranson was my list most listened to artist so um that's all down to oppenheimer and tenet actually to be fair um uh but yeah this uh this film also holds like two of the best scenes of the year i think the the trinity test scene is the best constructed scene of the year for me just everything all christopher Nolan's career is built up to that one scene and it's absolutely incredible every time i watch it it just it just gives me chills louis gorison's score in that scene is unreal um um best theater experience of the year for me as well um, i remember the first time going to see that nearly had a heart attack i had, i broke down in tears during that scene and after that scene because of how intense it was um and that was the first time i'd cried watching a film in absolute years um um so yeah that is a very very deserving uh number three spot um probably be a lot higher on others but uh yeah very 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 good so ryan what is your number three spot my number three is asteroid city uh, Wes is quickly became one of my favourite directors and this was a kind of an earlier on release in the year but one that I kept watching just when it came out I think I watched it like four times um, during that like one month that it came out and just after watching it so many times like I can safely say that Asteroid City is like up there as one of his best works and I don't think it'll ever pass Grand Budapest Hotel because I think that's just like his masterpiece it's my, one of my favorite films ever made so i don't know if it's ever gonna pass that but i think this definitely should be looked at as wes's best work and like we were saying earlier i think people will look back at this as 
much better than it is kind of now because I think it was pretty mixed reviews and the reception as it came out. Um, but yeah, I think it's it balances like so much of like everything that made his like past films well or great, like his cinematography um, and his character work. I think it all comes so perfectly into into like a blend in Natural City, and I think it is definitely up there as one of the best in his filmography. Um, yeah, just the character work, everything is just it, it's so good. Wes is Wes is maybe up there as one of my favorite film or directors. I know. Um, yeah, so it's a very high four and a half at my number three spot. Is that your highest weighted rated Wes Anderson film? <clears throat> or tied uh, with Grand Budapest. Is it five? Okay, gotcha. So, yeah, good pick. I'm glad that Asteroid City is getting some praise here because in March they will be getting absolutely none. <laughs> <Yep>. so, <laughs> so, my third spot, we've already talked about it, but I thought it was a fantastic film that came out this year, and that is Across the Spider Verse. Um, there's just something about this that's brilliant. The animating on twos, making it feel like a comic book or something, you know, surreal. Um, just really works for me. Um, the ensemble cast, again, they kind of went back to the what worked in 2018 with having all these different characters with different aspects, different uh, goals and motivations. Totally works again here in the second one. A lot of people had a problem with the fact that this had the part one syndrome where it kind of is a half of a movie. I didn't really have that problem. I think the cliffhanger kind of works because it kind of disjoints at a good point in the story. Same thing with Dune. Um, a lot of people didn't like Dune for that same reason, but as it's aged and as people have come around on it, you realize it's not actually that bad as a standalone movie. It's actually really impressive as a standalone movie, just as I think Across the Spider-Verse is. Um, it's on the cutting edge of animation. Whatever they're doing is breaking, pushing boundaries of what animation can be, and that's always great to see. That The character of the spot is just beautifully creative. Like The ability to manipulate uh, matter and you know, push it through time and space is just such like an artistic superpower. They use that so well. And then not to mention the reveal at the end. Of course, I feel like everyone should have seen it by this point in time, but we we get a a sneak peek of who the Prowler is in this universe, and it, it just kind of throws everything on its head. A lot of twists, a lot of great moments, some great scenes, great dialogue. Like, again, there's not a lot of wrong in this film. You can pick out a lot of flaws. There's just so much it does really well. And the fact that it is a part one doesn't really bother me at all. So for that reason, Across the Spider-Verse is definitely my number three. Um, it was sitting at my number one favorite film of the year. I absolutely adored it. I've seen it three times this year. So that tells you how much I love it. But it currently sits at my number three spot. Nice. My number three film is the savior film of the year. And that is the far superior to American cinema, Godzilla Minus One. It is, like I said, uh, I like I really judge a film at the end of the day by how much I want to rewatch it and how many times I'm going to revisit it. And this is one that I could just see endlessly and endlessly. Like, I'm probably going to be seeing it once a week until its theater run ends because it's just a movie that's, it's, you're going to pick up new things and notice new things on every watch while also still just being a fun experience on every watch. And... You know, I think what they really get right here is that Godzilla as a franchise is such a, like, it, the name's been so dragged through the mud where it's like, you think, if you say, oh, I'm going to see a Godzilla movie, you just think, like, a lot of people just think, like, okay, like, mega nerd, like, it's not like Marvel where it's kind of got, like, some status in, in everyday culture. It's very much considered, like, kind of like a nerdier franchise and very much like a toy franchise and special effects showcase and... This film reminds us what the real original Godzilla was about and how it's really not about any of that. And it's the original Godzilla was a story about post-war Japan and very much a lot of these feelings of fear that were deeply felt coming off of the, the two atomic bombs being dropped. And Godzilla very much is a metaphor for that. And this film not only understood that, but really made us feel just the terror of living in a world where... The atomic bomb had just been dropped. Like now we live in a I, now we live in a world where we've had these things for so long that I don't think we're as conscious of it in everyday life. But yeah, you know, this film set literally right after the war, so it's only it uh, it only makes sense to think that okay, it's only a matter of time before the next one goes off. And just those feelings of terror of the the anticipation of 
such a mass scale destruction and this film really captures so perfectly and also making just a, a brilliantly told story and a deep human story with uh just about redemption and uh it's like i said like the and like we've all talked about mentioning this movie it's when you watch an american godzilla movie my philosophy is always like why are the human characters why are we spending so much time with these human characters like no one cares about them like ryan said you're rooting for them to die it's like we're here to watch the monster and this film reminds us that no it's like it's we don't care about the human characters because they're poorly written human characters this film godzilla is absolutely takes a backseat to the human characters and it's a better film because of that because it's a, it's not a story about godzilla it's a story about the people of post-war japan which is why we should leave godzilla franchise to the japanese people because it's their story and it's rooted in real feelings that they had from post from after world war ii and it's that's why they executed on such a better level and also shout out to one of the best scores of the year but can't wait to do a full episode on it because i have so much to say about this blockbuster masterpiece of film reminding us what blockbuster cinema can be when done right well um moving into top two now and for me um i'm kind of surprised because like this sits at a 4.3 average though and i've seen like a, a decent amount of like four stars from a lot of people um but for me my number two spot goes to your boss lamp bosses poor things um a film that i am very fortunate to have seen now because um at the uk premiere at the london film festival because i will w- probably not watch this um i'm going a second time in about a week so i'm very happy to re-watching it but absolutely 100 percent deserving of my number two spot um i kind of see this as this as a, like similar themes to barbie and kind of exploring womanhood but for me this does it in a lot more mature way obviously um you know obviously a lot more weird way but i think it presents um the ideas a lot better than what barbie was trying to do um but this film just has so much more freedom to do that with a director like yorgos lanthimos um i just love his style of filmmaking there um there's disgusting aspects to this film this film is really sexual i love how sexually free this film is and it's definitely not going to be for a lot of people considering the kind of big anti-sex crowds um there is nowadays in my opinion as a lot of people don't see it that way but this i had such an incredible time with this film um it's it's like i said it's disgusting it's really weird and i love those kind of films um it, there's glimpses of frankenstein in this is such a brilliant screenplay um on identity um on kind of it's all it's 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 like an ad, adult coming of age film almost because like if you've seen the film you know what i'll get it's it's like a child's mind in a um in an adult's body and it's it's the most bizarre thing but in the best way possible and i had the best time watching this with a massive massive crowd it's some of the best comedy of the year emma stone unbelievable my favorite um female performance of the year and i think she absolutely deserves that oscar this year in my opinion um i cannot wait to rewatch this i had such an incredible time with it the ending is absolutely top notch um made me laugh so much um i can't wait for others to see this when it comes out in this country but yeah poor things absolutely deserving of my number two spot this year and definitely my favorite lanthimos so far and oscar makes it even more impressive that emma stone recorded all of those scenes out of order so her mental age was never a constant like she had to reduce and and subtract her iq based on what scenes she was shooting so i think that puts more weight into how amazing the performance is because she essentially grows up <laughs> throughout the film but yeah great performance I, great film i'm glad you picked it at number two i just need to say that if she didn't they didn't shoot that in chronological order that's actually fucking insane i know that's when i read that i was like there's no way there's no way that's but actually yeah, it's shot crazy. out of order on that when we eventually do an episode when yeah when ryan gets it under his belt it has been a pain for three months waiting for the film <laughs> so i've got six more days uh, I'll be disappointed it's if it's not at least in my top 10 was... <laughs> now it's gotta be right yeah but at my number 2 I have Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon I disagree with Alex I think this is 
it's, it's high up in Scorsese's ranking, I think. I'm still not exactly sure where it places, but this is Scorsese at the top of his game still. It's crazy that he's still performing like this at his age. Like, we see a lot of directors, like, kind of fall off when they get to this age most of the time. It's, it's not a normal occurrence. But um, Scorsese's still creating some, some of the best films of the year and epics that, like, we just don't really see that often and we probably won't see for a long time after this. So it's just, it's just crazy that he's still doing it. And this cast was stacked. Like, I think there were some of the best performances of the year. Like, when you when it's announced that DiCaprio and De Niro are working on a film together, you instantly have the highest of expectations, and I think they definitely achieved those and maybe even surpassed them because I think those performances are maybe even a bit underrated now because I've been seeing slander for both of them. Um, people even think they, don't, they shouldn't get nominated, which I think is crazy. I think De Niro delivers his best performance in, like, what, like, 20 years? Maybe since, like, Heat or Casino. Um... It's, it's I think Jackie it's definitely Brown. worth it. What'd you say? No, I just said since Jackie Brown. I think that's like the last. Okay, continue. I wasn't sure with the year. Yeah, it's probably not. But still, like 20 years. Like, it, I think it's definitely worthy. But winning the best sporting actor. Um, although I, I don't know if he is going to at this point. And it's one of DiCaprio's best as well. Even though he has a completely stacked career as well. He's still up there. Um, but definitely Willie Gladstone stole the show I think still somehow over these two giants of cinema like delivering just an insane performance I think she should be a lock for the winner um, for Best Actress I haven't seen Emma Stone yet um, it sounds crazy just from what you're saying um, so maybe she'll be up there once I see it but I think this was a, a really special performance and really elevated the film to my number two spot of the year uh, this is one of Scorsese's or one of my favourite Scorsese's but yeah, good pick. I'm sure glad. Uh, I'm glad you and I are both on team Killers of the Flower Moon. I I do agree. I think it's one of one of the best in his catalog. Um, yeah, for I love seeing the praise. I love seeing the praise for it. Even though <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to see it. It is a great film. I'm happy to see. It. But it just it just goes to show you how sprawling his you know filmography is, right? Like my least favorite Scorsese could be your favorite Scorsese. So it just goes to show you how deep his bag is. And yeah, Killers of the Flower Moon, no different. Absolutely immaculate film. Although I don't um, think but from my is anyone Scorsese favorite Scorsese film, but I get your point. I do agree. Yeah, like you never know. Film in his top ten would be like another director's yeah. like yeah, like any of his top ten. <laughs> There's probably like five that would <laughs> you wouldn't be shocked at all if someone was like, "This is my favorite movie of all time," and Scorsese got five of those. So I don't know. He has five okay, stars in my top ten. Like there's five star Scorsese movies that don't make my top ten, and there's multiple. Yeah, that's that, like that's crazy. Just a testament to I him as a filmmaker. I think. Scorsese films. How do you feel about that, Alex? Yeah, I only have two as well. Oscar, why are you on this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> but we we approve of Scorsese on this podcast. Okay, we we love him. He is the grandfather of cinema. Um, okay, but now we'll go into my number two. We've already kind of talked about it a lot. Maybe against contrary belief, but my number two is Oppenheimer by Christopher Nolan. Everyone's kind of said their own piece on it. They're kind of beating a dead horse right now, but it's just one of the best films of the year. Like Oscar said, some of the scenes in here, he mentioned the Trinity scene. That's not even my favorite scene in the film. That courtroom moment at the end when he's delivering that speech to a empty, seemingly empty room auditorily, but filled physically. Um, there's just so much like control that Nolan kind of puts on display with that scene. And Killian Murphy, like, what the hell? I did not know he had that in his bag. I've always viewed him as like a really good actor, but not someone like that who's able to kind of put a movie on his back and like carry it as a sole lead with such an introspective um, kind of performance. So yeah, Oppenheimer for me is amazing. Robert Downey Jr. kind of people start, forgot, forgot about him, stopped talking about him. He could be up for best supporting uh, actor. He was exceptional in there as well. Some really good moments. A lot of good cameos as well. Uh, Casey Affleck's thrown in there. But yeah, Oppenheimer's just one of those. Fires on all three cylinders. Three hours. I could I could have sat there for another two hours. It was perfect. I was just in the world of Oppenheimer and totally adored every minute of it. Um, a really exceptional film. And I could see it being a five star for me in the future. But it's four and a half right now. Seen it a few times. But my number two is Oppenheimer. The, the way he does that JFK name drop in that film is always hilarious to me. Yeah. Like, it, it feels like a cameo. Kind of yeah. 
Uh, I'm expecting a JFK spinoff movie <laughs> next. <laughs> My, my number two is the film that proves that nobody knows what a real Wes Anderson style movie is, and that is Asteroid City. I think that when you look at Wes Anderson's filmography, it's it, one of his. There's a stupid TikTok trend where it's like, oh, it's just symmetry and bright colors. Like his style is so much more than just that. And I think what it is is this one by one building where everything builds one thing at a time. And I think it, it speaks for his filmography too, where I feel like. He adds a new element of the Wes Anderson style in every film that you watch. And now, this, which is why I think every film he does gets better. And I think that this is the best Wes Anderson film yet because I think it's, it, he just keeps perfecting and adding to his style. And that's a lot what you see here. Where like the music, it's like one instrument builds at a time. One layer of motion builds at a time. And I think his mastery of motion and just the, how precise every single motion is in this film and just they all enter one one at a time at different speeds and it's just so perfectly crafted there's just so many moving choreographed pieces that kind of just flow in synchronization so perfectly that i think very direct very few directors are capable of executing but having just such a variety of style and you know there's almost no symmetry in this film there's like there's people talk about oh his films are all about symmetry there's look there's very little symmetry in this film and there's Still, and still, you can still look at any frame of it and say, okay, that's a Wes Anderson film. Because I think even though people don't know what it is that defines his style, it's still very clear. You just know it when you see it. And I think he's constantly improving it. He creates a great world here that's just the production design's incredible and just a great world around the characters. And it's, uh, it's I think, his best crafted film. And with his film, it's always about this perfectionist uh perfectionism and craftsmanship and an appreciation for not just the art of filmmaking but just so many art forms as a whole that you're always see with a lot of them in French Dispatch but also here like a big his background in theater and such an appreciation for theater here and you know old school television like Twilight Zone which is clearly a big influence on this and just another stepping stone and Wes Anderson has become one of the most reliable directors if you like his style and I think that, you know, I just can't wait to see where it goes next, but I think this is his best one yet, and the Oscars is going to be making a great mistake when they rob this film down the board. I was, I'm actually shocked that we are so high on Asteroid City. Like, I knew that I was high on it, but as a podcast, minus Oscar, I guess, we're pretty high on it. Like, we all had it in our top tens. So, yeah, it's, really it, it's good to see Asteroid City getting praise. Um, and if you haven't seen it, if you're just kind of f stumbling into movies right now and you don't know what we're talking about, Wes Anderson, unique style, go check it out. Like Wes Anderson and his style with Asteroid City is something to behold. Um, a really great, great film. So good pick, Alex. And we'll likely be covering it at some point if you want more in-depth on, on it and that why it will likely be robbed of an Oscar. Absolutely. Let us know what other films that we should cover. We've done a few episodes on films we've mentioned, so if you want to do a deep dive on any of these films that we're talking about, we might have an episode on it. Go back on our page, check it out. We've done Past Lives, Oppenheimer, a few others, so definitely check that out as well. But now, the number ones. The number one. <clears throat> okay, for me, I am the only person, luckily, who has seen this film I, I didn't even plan to see this film. I I got back from like my first weekend of the festival. I got back to my uni thing. I had like another day that I was going down to London for. Um, I was only going down for a day. I only had two things. I just started looking at all the other things that were on that week. And there were some really cheap tickets for things. So I was, I was like, right, screw it. I'm going to just spend some of the other money that I'd saved up. Uh, had to put away for that summer. And I, I luckily managed to snag a ticket um of like people that were selling them on twitter for the best film of the year that is the zone of interest so i'm very very happy that i have seen this um yeah I, this film is is unbelievable really that i've just never seen a film like it to be honest jonathan glazer he should absolutely be picking up best director this year but he won't be unfortunately uh, I, I don't I really hope he gets a nomination. I really hope this gets a best picture nom it should be winning best picture, it should be winning best director. Um yeah, I I've never seen anything like it before. The 
I've never been so haunted by a war drama in my life. Uh, that's through the direction, the sound design, the score is just unbelievable. It shook me to my core. I, I think about it every single day. Um, I will hopefully hopefully be rewatching this, um, but I can only see it going higher for me. Um, there's, I'm I'm kind of glad that the trailers that they've put out. I think match the style of the film really really well. But there's there's just aspects, really experimental aspects of the trailers are just hiding their thing and going to surprise a lot of people. Um, because go, I went into this completely blind. Obviously, I hadn't released any trailers at the time. They'd only like released a couple of teaser images. Um, for this so this is an unbelievable experience for me and i, I yeah I, I haven't been there kind of this attached and this shaken by a war story in maybe ever honestly um literally 90 percent of the shots in this film are static shots and then you get that kind of five ten percent which are just um kind of camera movement which just makes those uh kind of panning shots um just so much more effective in this film um i've seen like comparisons to kind of parkovsky style this film and i can definitely see that because it's, it's a toned down there's nothing kind of really dramatic about this film uh, apart from kind of the sound design there's no oh there's no like big battles or anything but it, it will sit with you forever and i know even the people that gave it slightly lower ratings have kind of said the same thing they they haven't seen anything like this and i really hope everyone gets the opportunity to see this because it is a, it's an absolutely incredible incredible film that um I hope gets the distribution it deserves, but it's not looking like so at the moment. But yeah, my number one of the year is the zone of interest. Oscar, do you think? Do you think Sandra Holler together and release this damn movie so we can watch? Okay, facts. Damn. Yeah. I know. And what's this whole trend of like, remember how Oscar season used to be like November or early December? Now it's like January. Like, what the yeah. hell are we doing? Let's, yeah, let's get a... now, now, Like I said, half of my top 15 is December releases. Like, it's, Yeah, I know. It's, it's but I guess released. everything ever all at once was released in May. Like, come on. Read them. I know. Uh, yeah. It's bizarre. Yes. Yeah, but I was going to say, you guys sorry, Oscar, I was going to ask you. Yeah, sorry. I was going to ask you, did you think that Sandra Huller's performance in Anatomy of Fall was better than Zone of Interest? Or did Anatomy you prefer Anatomy of Fall was better because she, uh, she isn't, she's not, not, not the main role of, um, gotcha. um, in the Zone of Interest. And you see, she, she gets so, there's kind of not a ton of, there's like a good amount of dialogue in this film, but obviously you guess she just gets so much more and so much more time to shine in Anatomy of Fall. But between this and the Zone of Interest, she has had an absolutely incredible year. Um, yeah. but yeah, the performance in the the performance in this is uh, they're really really strong. Um, but hmm. that's that's not like the shining light of this film for me. Um, gotcha. But yeah, I just hope everyone gets a chance to see this, especially in theaters as well, because I think the sound design and the score of this film deserve to be heard um, in a theater or with some extremely good headphones on. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, there's there's just nothing like it. I have not seen your top two. I'm very excited to see both of them. Cause yeah, I'm, I'm so excited. Like, mm. like he's one of the probably one of the better UK directors. Yeah, yeah, he's such a fascinating director. Um, and I'm just I'm so excited to see what he does next. I know because um, I was speaking to George about this um, uh, a couple of weeks back, and he was saying when he saw the um, New York Film Festival that they did a Q and A afterwards, and people were just hurling things at him, like um just asking like why why did you do this like it, it probably just got really really awkward and like he came out before um with um uh with the actors as well so that was really really good to see he kind of spoke a bit about the film but yeah i think a q a would have uh been a bit too much especially kind of a film around this kind of subject and the way he approaches it is going to be really really controversial but you know, I've, I've i've just i've never been affected by a film like that like this before one of my favorite endings really of the year as well. Well, okay. I'm um, going on to my number one. I have, of course, it's Oppenheimer, as you'd probably expect. As we've talked about before, so I'll just touch on it. It's, I get this is my favorite Nolan film by far at this point. Like, I've seen it like four times in theaters. It's one of my favorite films to ever see in IMAX. So I get takes advantage of it perfectly. It's, it, takes like kind of like all the aspects of Nolan's films he uses like 
everything in his toolkit for this like one film this is his his magnum opus he's finally managed to blend those kind of like like grand like audio and like more technical marvels that he's always done and kind of brings the best character work of his career that i've ever seen and you were like we're talking about kelly and murphy it, it be one of the biggest robberies in history if he does not win that best actor um oscar because it, it's an unreal performance definitely my favorite of the year um ludwig Gorenson, he is becoming one of my favorite um what's the word composer i don't know <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah um he's becoming one of my favorites it's he, i really hope he continues working with nolan um even though um, in the past, it's always been good, but I think he, he, all his scores are very different for all these films, so he always brings something new. Um, and I think this is this should be a lock for like we seen last year, like Babylon. If Babylon can't win score, then like anything can happen. Who do you um, think they're going to give it to if they give it to anybody else? What poor thing? Paul Giamatti. That could be a legacy award for Giamatti. Oh no, for the score. Oh what? Oh for actor. Oh sorry, I thought you were talking about like, actor. <clears throat> no, I was talking about score. It should have it in the bag for score this year because there's yeah, momentum. It should. Now, Maybe well, Daniel Denis, Pemberton Denis across the Spider Verse. Uh, Denis can stick with hands and uh, Nolan can have uh, Ludwig now. I think, yeah, I think it's a go. good compromise. Yeah. But yeah, it's 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 my only five actually. The year I forgot to mention that it's yeah I had that five after several rewatches. It was all I could think of the whole of July. Um, mm -hmm. like everybody else. Yeah, it's just it's probably it's. Up there is one of my favorite films of all time, just in general. Never went the year, so it's it's got to be my number one. Nice. Well, what was your number one of the year? My number one, another film we've already touched on, but it is Past Lives. Um, for me, Past Lives is arguably my favorite romance ever. Um, there's just something so intimate and emotional about the the story. Kind of hits home in a way that, like, in an unconventional way, in a way that other romances don't really hit me. Um, Obviously, like we talked about before Sunset or like In the Mood for Love are two phenomenal films, but I think you could rival it with past lives. I think there's just so much being said about what it means to leave what you're used to or leave comfort, stepping out of your comfort zone. And past lives just has a beautiful commentary on that. Again, it's one of those human experience films like we've mentioned with Rice Boy Sleeps and a few others, but you just kind of enjoy humans being humans. And that's kind of, again, one of my favorite genres and uh, like we also said, Celine Song and Greta Lee are two of the brightest emerging young female talents in the industry right now. And Past Lives definitely put them on notice. I hope their next projects uh, flourish as well. But yeah, Past Lives, definitely my favorite movie of the year. I went back and forth. I had Oppenheimer. I had Spider-Verse. But at the end of the day, I think about Past Lives the most. Um, and it impacted me the most. It's brilliantly made, brilliantly acted. And my favorite film of the year. Nice. I didn't actually expect that to be honest. Yeah. yeah little, little screwball. Deserving though. <laughs> very deserving. My number one of the year is a film that I didn't expect to be my number one of the year, and it was not in my top five most anticipated, despite being on most other people's. Of course, I'm talking about Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. Christopher Nolan's a director who I I like so many things about him and like what he stands for: practical effects, the movie theater experience. And there's there's so many things that he vouches for that I like shooting on film like that I really do love and I just never like I go into every Nolan film wanting to love it so much and I just kind of feel like it, it always falls short at least for me and this is the finally the one that I walked into and I'm like this is like the Nolan film that I can finally like truly honestly love and there's just so much I love about it. I absolutely think that it's a culmination of his entire career. Like I mentioned, the episode where you see traits of literally every single Nolan film, you see some trait of it in this one all coming together. And I think it's one of the best, you know, I, I, I don't always love his approach to character writing. And I think this is one of the best character pieces he's ever done with just such an interesting character with the, the mind of a genius, just the open mindedness and the different directions his brain can go. But most importantly, just the, the high of creating and just the way music makes you feel this high of just creating and letting your mind roam free and just discovery and experimenting and all of these things. But then at the same time, that cost of creativity and you know what the cost can be and what your creation becomes something that's almost too big and becomes 
dangerous to a degree. And just the the way it deals with the psychology of Oppenheimer. I love everything about it so much, more than I can speak in this limited amount of time, but we've luckily done a full episode on it. And just the, the craftsmanship Nolan does to the film with his very keep it moving forward at a rapid fire pace with brilliant fluidity. The scenes flow from one to the next so perfectly. And of course, his incredible biggest strength being the sound and the music with his sound design just being simply on another level. As you can always expect from Nolan, he's one of the best auditory directors ever. And then, of course, top three most important things in film. Number one, music. Number two, music. Number three, music. Best score of the year. Ludwig Morgensen knocked it out of the park. I was listening to this on repeat for at least a month after, and I'm still listening to it frequently. It's just such an incredible score, and just the performances are incredible. It's it's an absolute masterpiece of a film that, you know, we did a full episode on it, and I can do another full episode now that I've seen it more times, and there's that many new things to say about it because there's that much to speak on with a movie of this caliber, which I hope to go on to win Best Picture, and it's uh, that's my number one of the year. Good pick. You say you like films that have good music, good music, good music, and yet you don't like Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> And you, you're muted, and do not say Lord of the Rings does not have good music. <laughs> good, it's it's not the best ever. I mean, the movies are boring as shit. Oh, That's the music is so crazy. good. And, and no, at times it is very good, it is. Like, the one moment in Return of the King where he's, like, for Frodo and they charge, like, that's a fire musical moment. I can credit where it's still. Like, that, that's, that seems fire. But Lord of the Rings but... is such, like, a filmmaker's film, you know? Like, I can't believe you're such a purist and you don't like Lord of the Rings. Like, that's such a shock to me, you know? We're running for our own time. We don't have enough time to get into why. Well, okay, Rings. okay. <laughs> Lord of the Rings for another anyway, episode. Well, we're going to do... Yeah, we need to do the podcast, I don't know, so... What I think will be really quite fun to do real quick is we'll go through our top 10 most anticipated films of 2023 and see where they rank compared to uh, compared to in our actual rankings. So I'll breeze through mine real quick. My number 10 most anticipated was Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 3. That dropped four spots to number 14. Number 9 was Across the Spider-Verse. That went up to 6. Then I had at number... Number eight most anticipated was David Fincher's The Killer. That dropped all the way to 22. May, might not be my most popular take. Number seven was Mario Brothers. So even though I have it on 10, it was higher on my anticipated list. So I guess that's a, <laughs> for you, that's a, that's a worst take. <laughs> that's a worst take. <laughs> number, number, six was, number six was Oppenheimer, which actually was two spots lower at eight because two ones that were above it ended up not getting released this year. But that was number six. That went up to number one. Number five was Bo is Afraid. That went up to number four. Number four is Asteroid City. Went up to two. Number three was Maestro, which dropped to seven. Number two was Ferrari, which dropped to 18 and is may go down a little more. And number one was Killers of the Flower Moon, which dropped to eight. So what are the rest of your most anticipated and how do they stack up in your final rankings? I mean, I didn't, I didn't really have a list. Yeah, but, uh, Ryan, Ryan, do you have a list? Go ahead. I a, yeah, I have a list. Okay, my number one, me. Dune Two, Moment of Silence for Dune. We did oh, not get that this year. Um, number two, Killers of the Moon was num was my number two of the year, so exactly where I wanted it. Um, number three was Bo's Afraid. Um, what was that? That was number eight for me, so it's st still a banger. Um, number four, Poor Things. I haven't seen that yet, um, but I'm sure it'll be good. Number five, Napoleon. I really thought that was going to be oh, one of the best yeah. of the year. But that was very disappointing. Let me check. I have it in 33 Oof. in my ranking. So that was a big disappointment. Number five, David Fincher's The Killer. That is just inside my top 10 at 14. So it's not a huge disappointment, but a bit disappointing compared to what I thought it was going to be. Um, number six, I had Zone of Interest. I've not seen that either. Um, and that was... Very much. Well, I had a hit, Hitman. I don't know when I, but that, but that's not out yet either. Yeah. Um, very oh, ma Maestro. That was okay. <laughs> I don't have like a, a most anticipated list, but um, some of mine were definitely Oppenheimer up there. Um, I'm trying to think of Spider Verse is up there. They're all up there now. John Wick. So they're kind of really, really high. Um, what else did I have? I had Mission Impossible really high up. I, I thought it was a good movie, but 
coming from the standards that like the last one left i was expecting more honestly so i was i was a left i still really i still liked it but i was a bit disappointed with it um that ended up uh, like 30th for the year for me napoleon definitely the biggest disappointment uh for me that's like 60th which is is not great um june would have been my number one most anticipated but um Less than two months now, so the countdown <laughs> is on. I'm yeah, I don't sleep like nights before that comes out, man. I don't really have um, a top ten like off. Oh, sorry, you got some um, more. I, I've seen like di- like the disappoint. Oh, the creator as well. Um, kind Ooh. of like halfway through the year, that was really high up. Um, that was a disappointment. Um, and I've seen people like have Rebel Moon on their disappointment lists. What I expected expect? it to be absolutely <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. not disappointed. It was exactly what I was expecting it to be. I like, agree. Do people really have that much faith in Zack Snyder? Clearly. And um, the creator as well was kind of disappointing, but yeah, kind of what I expected. Uh, but yeah, like like we say every year, there's always the unexpected hidden gems. That, I, forgot, um, I forgot my biggest disappointment. Um, Wonka. I thought that was going to be a solid two stars. I came out with one. <laughs> biggest disappointment of the year. Stop, man. Stop. No, mine. Okay, here, here are some of my an- most anticipated. I don't have a list or anything, but going into this year, just like my mind, where my mind was at. Oppenheimer, obviously. The Killer by David Fincher. A little bit underwhelmed, I would say. Um, Napoleon, I was super excited for. A little bit overwhelmed. Saltburn, I was really excited for. A little bit underwhelmed. Ferrari, I was super excited for. A little underwhelmed. Not underwhelmed. <laughs> yeah. Mission uh, yeah, Impossible. Yeah. Same thing. Sorry, Alex, what's that? Since, like I said in the beginning, the year of disappointment. My expectations yeah. are really high. A little bit. So I guess those are the ones I was most anticipating. But was afraid, honestly, might have been my number one or two, if not, if behind Oppenheimer across the Spider-Verse. And that was a big disappointment for me. So yeah, kind of a year of disappointment, but also like... Some really beautiful films that I never expected to love, like Rice Boy Sleeps or The Holdovers or Anatomy of a Fall or May December, Iron Claw, Blackberry. So, yeah, yeah. interesting year. Dial of Destiny was, I wasn't expecting anything great, but I wasn't expecting it to be that terrible. I was expecting James it to be Mangle awful. Me a little bit of hope. I will say that. Like the fact that James Mangle was involved, I was like, all right, it probably won't be that. Big. Yeah. Yeah. Like people were saying, oh, it's Disney. the di- The direction wasn't the fault. I thought that was really, really weak, di- weak direction from Mangold in that film. Um, the Flash. I I want to know how much the they Flash. paid like Tom Cruise and all those people to say that the Flash <laughs> like the greatest film ever. This was all. It must have been millions of dollars, dude. There's no way you watch that movie and then you want to spew how yeah. great of a movie it is. There's no way. Tom Hanks is not watching the last four of that movie, seeing like. Those all those cameos and then no way oh, yeah that, like a, the, like the most way. disrespect ever that that scene awful honestly Grand yeah. Turismo as well I expected more and that was absolutely awful I yeah. eleven to fifteen like they were so like and most anticipated all finished so much lower than <laughs> had them as but was let, Teenage let, Mutant Ninja Turtles that on yours Alex. No, I didn't. Like, I was, I had a feeling it wasn't going to live up to expectations, but I will say it was much worse than I expected. That movie blows cash. <laughs> Maybe the most overrated yeah. film of the year, honestly. From, I see so much praise for it, and it, it was, I just, it's, man, it's, I could not come as for it. Most characters just swapped in. Like, it's, it's a terrible movie. Ash is going to stop watching our podcast now. Between the John Wick slander and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Tan- <laughs> Turtles slander, there's no way he's tuning in. Teenage Mutant Turtles slander is well deserved. <laughs> Same with but anyway, anyway let, let's move into. So now we're going to move into our top, uh, our best theater experiences of the year. Uh, me personally, I saw over 350 films in theaters this year. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, I got I got a long list to pick from. Uh, I guess I'll start us off real quick. Terrible honorable mentions. Seeing Oppenheimer was definitely incredible. Fortunately, on fire for the first time. The only reason this didn't crack my top twenty is because it's it was in literally the worst theater, so that's the only reason. Vertigo I'd seen before, great every time. I saw Streets of Fire, which is a true hidden gem. I saw it. I just got on a bought back from New York on a bus at eleven at night, and it was playing. 
total hidden gem. Love that. Lost Highway, seeing that in theaters, gave me new appreciation, appreciation for it. Raging Bull and Taxi Driver. Both of them, anytime you get to see them in theaters, is incredible. The only reason they're lower is just because I've seen them in theaters multiple times. On to the good ones. Number 20, Midnight Show, Big Trouble, Little, Big Trouble in Little China. That's just such a fun movie and such a fun theatrical experience every time you get to see it. Number 19, Goodfellas. I've seen it in theaters multiple times, but it had been a while, and it's just, it's Goodfellas. Don't need to say much more. 18, Across the Spider-Verse. I was in LA on opening night when I saw this at the Chinese Theater for the first time, which was just a cool experience to see that in just such a cool IMAX theater. Number 17, Humphrey Bogart's Hidden Gem, one of the most underrated movies of the, of the 1940s, Dark Passage. It's just such a masterpiece. It reminded me just how underrated this is and why it is true top tier of its era and one of the best noirs. 16, Michelangelo Antonioni's masterpiece, La Ventura. La Ventura is just incredible. It's some of the greatest cinematography I've ever seen in my life. And even though there was a projector error when I first got there, I don't even care because just seeing cinematography that quality on the big screen made me so inspired in terms of what you can do in terms of the photography of film Antonioni is just it's just one of the best 15 saw Barry Lennon for the first time incredible don't really say much every frame of painting May Number oh did you guys hear something my bad sorry <laughs> no wait hey. uh, I still can't get over the fact you think that Pony is better than Barry Lyndon that is we're not saying this tangent but... oh my god Number 14, Metropolis, one of the greatest spectacles in film history, one of the best silent films ever, and saw it with a live organ player at the Star Colonial Theater, which is one of my favorite theaters. It's where they shot the film The Blob. Number 13, The Maltese Falcon, I hadn't seen it in a while. My most recent watch had been At Home Watch, where it was starting to drop for me a bit, and then this watch totally reminded me why this is one of the greatest films ever and why I love this film so much, why it's one of my favorites ever. Absolutely incredible as part of the Sight and Sound series. 12, it was a huge cloud of smoke in Philly and the suburbs. They said, do not leave your house. They said, this is toxic air quality. But Sunset Boulevard is playing in theater, so I drove an hour in toxic air to see this movie, and it was absolutely worth it. If I lose a couple of years off my life, it was well worth it. Sunset Boulevard's a masterpiece. Number 11, Lawrence of Arabia. Every time you get to see that film on the big screen, it's incredible. Maybe the greatest big screen film ever made. It's, it's just an absolute masterpiece. Yeah, that'd be an insane watch. Yeah, it was so great. Also, I shout out to an honorable mention. I got to see David Lean's other masterpiece in theaters this year, Dr. Zivago, which was incredible. Number 10, Return of the Jedi in Dolby was absolutely incredible and proved to me that it is the best directed Star Wars film. It's not better than Empire Strikes Back, but it's the best directed Star Wars film. And seeing that, in it made me feel like I was, you know, seven, eight years old again, seeing that in Dolby was just such an immersive, incredible experience because Star Wars... The, maybe the most defining trait of it, it was, the most defining trait is its sound and its music and in the Dolby surround sound it was just incredible experience absolutely love that ended up seeing that film four times in theaters this year but then we got nine Once Upon a Time in Hollywood in Tarantino's theater New Beverly Cinema is incredible it's a film that I've been wanting to rewatch for a while and I finally got to rewatch it on 35mm in Tarantino's theater not much more needs to be said it's the best Tarantino film it is in my gun to my head top 20 films ever made it's just incredible number eight blade runner 2049 for the first time i've been holding out for a theater on this one absolutely worth it incredible maybe the best looking film ever made number seven a film i hadn't seen because i just couldn't find it anywhere on streaming and been wanting to watch for a while when i finally got to see this at the pfs Bourse, it was blew away my expectations to become not only one of my favorite films but in the upcoming short film that I'm preparing right now, it's literally the most influential film on that, and that is Bernardo Bertolucci's masterpiece, The Conformist. Just one of the most absolute masterpieces of cinema on every level. Become easily one of my favorite films ever. Number six, Alexander McKendrick's The Sweet Smell of Success. It's just one of the best noirs ever with one of the best jazz scores. Brilliant blocking, underrated direction, incredible film. Now we're getting into the top five, which are just some of my absolute favorites. Number five, one of my... These are like five of my, like, I can't decide between them favorite films ever. Number five was The 400 Blows, Frank from France, Watch It Foe. One of my favorite films. A lot of personal connection to it. Just incredible. Number four could easily be number... Four to one could easily be interchangeable. And four is Babylon for the first time. 
it's just, it's the best film of the 21st century. Seeing this for the first time, I couldn't stop thinking about it for days. Ended up seeing it three times within four days because it was so incredible. It's Babylon. It's a masterpiece. I don't need to say much more. Number three, Chunking Express, one of the theater experiences that truly changed my life. It really made me want to dive into Juan Clawai's filmography. It inspired me to go shoot photography that night. And it's uh, it's just a film that changed my life on so many levels. It's one of the best. Then one and two, I was uh, a little under the influence, to say the least. I'll leave it at that. And for both of these, which heightened these experiences very greatly. Number two being the masterpiece from Juan Carwai, In the Mood for Love. Just... That literally one of the greatest films ever. And then my favorite film ever, also in theaters, every time I get seen in theaters, changes my perspective on life and is the most inspiring experience ever. It's the one of the only Federico Fellini's masterpiece at the Philadelphia Film Center, La Dolce Vita. Damn. Beautiful list. I don't know, have Damn. anywhere near as much as a... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh... There were some I just picked up, which is why I had so many. There were too many great ones to pick from. But out of 350, 20 is not that much. <laughs> That's true. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Um, so for me, um, Oppenheimer, probably my first film on film, saw it in 70 millimeter. That was an incredible experience for me. Um, in kind of the last week of December, I went down to London, saw a load of things, um, did a Blade Runner double feature in the Prince Charles Cinema. Cinema. That was really, really good. Really, really enjoyed that. Fanny Alexander the next day at the BFI, along with the Thin Red Line as well. Those were absolutely brilliant um, to see, especially considering Fanny Alexander. That was the first watch me in the Thin Red Line. is one of my favorite films ever. So that was just brilliant. And then a couple of days before I saw La La Landing concert in the Royal Albert Hall with Justin Ho as conducting, I count that as a cinema experience. That was absolutely unbelievable. Um and then uh it's a wonderful life as well i saw for a first time in the cinema i absolutely adored that so so much um the shining as well saw that in the cinema um such an incredible experience just watching kubrick films uh saw 2001 in the cinema as well that was unbelievable just the entirety of the london film festival as well I saw 15 things all of those were absolutely brilliant um it's just like going like seeing films like re released, I know like over here it's in like living in a bigger city, it's a lot easier, but kind of where I am is a bit more difficult. So it's a pleasure to see like older things like Days and Confused. That was an incredible cinema experience for me this year. Um, trying to think going back to earlier on in the year, what other cinema experiences that I loved. I think honestly, those are the biggest standouts for me. Um, Babylon as well. Saw that five times in 10 days in the cinema. Um, that first ultra was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, so for me, those are kind of my main standouts. Mm, yeah, in terms of like new releases, it's probably Babylon and seeing Oppenheimer in 70mm. Uh, in terms of re-releases, um, my favourite was definitely Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I seen that in, well, it was the first film I'd seen in 35mm um, in like June, I think it was. And that elevated it all the way up into like my top 10 of all time like i love that movie now well i always loved it but that made it like properly like right at the top um i also seen tenet in 35 millimeter that was like my fa least favorite nolan at the time and i well, i'd never seen it in the theaters because it came out during covid um but that is one of my favorite nolans now that was a, a very second best experience Nolan. second best gross Nolan. gross yeah, second best that's a Nolan. disgusting take Second best, Nolan. <laughs> uh, some others, Scarface, uh, the whole Lord of the Rings trilogy that was great. Titanic in three D, the star of the year, um, from the best action director of all time, James Cameron, just to get that in every episode. Don't make um, me laugh. I throw it in me laugh. <laughs> Taping cool take. Uh, also, it's a wonderful life. That was also mm. great last month to see in cinemas the first time. I think that's all my big ones. Yeah. What about you, Will? Yeah, I didn't really have a ton. I probably went to the theater 30 to 40 times this year. Um, I didn't really watch any re-releases in the theater, mostly just new releases. Um, in terms of new releases, the, my best theater experience were Past Live and Oppenheimer. Past Lives, I was one of only two people in the theater, and we were just crying, me and this other woman, alone in the theater. 
it was exceptional a great theater experience and then oppenheimer exact opposite pack theater the loudest most visceral heart pounding experience of the year so two very different experiences but really great for their individual reasons um and then in terms of like first time watch because i guess i don't know i, I saw a couple of good first time watches this year i'll shout them out real quick in the Mood for Love, one of my favorite movies of all time, The Graduate, Sunset Boulevard. Those movies immediately became one of my favorite movies of all time, all first watches of this year. Unfortunately, I didn't get to see them in the theater, but um, additionally, The Apartment, Portrait of Lady on Fire, L.A. LA Hain, and Paths of Glory, all really exceptional films that were on my watch list and I've been meaning to get around for. Um, but yeah, my 2023 was definitely a really good year of watching movies and I, I'm impressed with the work I did. Okay, first person is Will. Oh yes. Damn it. Are you gonna are you gonna roll for everyone or do you want me to just pick? Yeah, I will. Okay. Then it's Ryan just wonderful. <laughs> just wonderful. Oh god, I'm never getting that, am I? Um and then third and fourth. I am third and Alex is fourth. Okay. I didn't want to be third, honestly. That's <laughs> third, third is always the worst. That's the worst. <laughs> okay, well, start us off. Okay, here's the thing. There's, I don't feel like there's a definitive number one yes, for 2024. Thank you. Oh, okay. Good, how are you? Um... Okay, yeah, there is. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go do <laughs> the part two. <laughs> yeah. It's okay, Oscar. I will let you get probably your number to because I am going to go with um, Francis Ford Coppola's. Metal That's not confirmed. Twenty twenty four, is it? Is it? It is. No, Adam Driver. It is. I'm thinking that it it will be out in three months. You can go whichever way. Fair man. enough. Fair enough. Um, I need to add that to my list. Um. Okay, so in that case, I will go with my number two, and that is absolutely going to be Robert Eggers' Nosferatu. I was going to yeah, pick well, that first. Well, you uh, are idiots, man. I can't believe this fell to me. Give me Bong Joon-ho's Mickey 17. That was my next pick. That's my next pick. That was I, a, I feel that, that was, was a very good valid. Film. That wasn't a, I think. That's actually my top four most anticipated films for next year. Yeah. Just not like the scene. All right, then give one. me, then I'll do Del Toro's Frankenstein. That's not that's not going to be next year. Oh yeah, that's not going to be next year. No, it's, it's not. Shooting it yet. It's not. It's not he, he he was scouting locations last month. All right, and in that case, give me Richard Linklater's Hitman. Oh well, yeah, I forgot that I've already seen a few. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, Oscar's got more 2024's watch than I have 2023's watch, bro. <laughs> <laughs> um, ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, okay, so my next pick for me is definitely going to be Furiosa, definitely. Mm. You can have that. Yeah. You can have that. You can have that. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to match the level of the greatest action film ever made, but um, I'm very excited Hard for that. it. Don't you dare mention Tom Hardy and greatest ever in the same sentence. Okay, uh, Ryan. Okay, uh, I'm stuck between two here, but I think I will go with Gladiator 2. It's Paul Mesco. And no, nice, it's got, nice. Uh, it's got That's a good pick. I was going to go for that one, but since you have taken that one, I'm going to go with the Joker sequel. That's the mm. other one I was thinking of. I don't know what it's called. Full, full Blade. 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 Wait, Ryan, what'd you take? Gladiator 2. Got it. Um, Will, you have two. Oh, yeah. I've got back to back. I forgot. Mm -hmm. Ooh, okay. So maybe I'll go. Ooh, I don't know. Okay, I feel like this will get votes. This is kind of a pander pick, but I'm going to go Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Nice, nice, nice. Ryan? Pretty good pick. Um, what pick is this? Number three or four? Three. There is a huge one on the board that I don't think anyone has on their radar. Um, 
is there? Is there? Maybe. And don't say Sonic 3. <laughs> No, no, it's not that. No, I, no, I think there's no, no, there's one that I don't think you know is a 2024 release, but you can oh. be damn right I'm going to take it. All right. Okay. Can can I like cheat and go zone of interest? Nah. No, that's, actually, it's going to get Oscars 2023. I think yeah. it's definitely 2023. Yeah, that's 2023. Well, okay. So I can't, I can't, I was going to do poor things as a laugh pick because I'm the only one that's seen it. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, um, I'm going to say that. Yeah, it's just... I've yeah. still got a couple. Of yeah, i got a couple I'm looking at. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back soon. I'm excited for that. So. Oh, I wasn't even thinking yeah. about that. Okay. It's horror for next year. Mm-hmm. I'm cautiously optimistic. Yeah, so am I. Do you guys um, prefer Pearl or X? X. 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 Yeah, X. Oh, it's green. Daisy prefers uh, Pearl. It suits uh, Ty West's style better, in my opinion. Agreed. Um, for me, my third pick, uh, I've got between two, and I... Well, this won't get back to me yet, Will. I'm going to go for Alien Romulus. Do love. It's a good pick. A good alien film, and I've utmost faith in uh, Fede Alvarez. And that was not even on my radar. Lane Spaney is starring. That is a win. I will um, happily take, or is it me or is it someone else? You. I will happily take Kinds of Kindness from the great director, Yorgos Lanthimos. That is not going to be next year. Yes, it will. It is already completed production, and they're already what? editing the film. That is really? definitely that's gonna no be way. That's twenty twenty four release. I, I saw him in an interview yesterday. I knew that. I feel like half the things. Like I knew none of you know it. Twenty twenty four. I'll let you take it. I'll let you have it. I'll, I'll no, because I literally it. watched two interviews with Yorgos yesterday, where he said the film has been is completed production, and they are already editing it. That means it is a guaranteed late twenty twenty four release. Well, not guaranteed because there's no release date. Very likely. Ch- None chances of these are. are. Dune, Dune, okay. 20, Dune 2 had a release date of 2023. We saw all that worked out. Anything's subject to change. My money's on it coming out in 2024. Okay. okay. Next I'll up, I will, I'll double that up with Perfect Days. That's 2023. That's 2023. Yeah. 2023. Has, has anyone seen it in 2023, though? It's, it's, yes. it's part of the 2023 yeah. Oscars. It was a little yeah. film festival. All right. That throws a wrench in this. All right. What do I want then? I've still there's a the huge big hitter. There's nothing stuck. Don't take my next pick, please. I'm definitely not taking whatever your next pick is. Don't the ones I'm pick. deciding between are not on your radar. I'm going to go with... I was considering the new M. Night Shyamalan movie. But yeah. I'm going to put track. my bet... Why? Is that what you were, is that what you were going to take? No. Oh, all right, and now I'm. I mean, you know what I'm gonna go with? I'm gonna go with a wild card. I'm gonna go with Paul Schrader's O Canada. I don't know shit about it. I just know Paul Schrader's directing it, and it's obviously about Canada. I've just <laughs> never even heard of that film before. I don't know. Yeah. For me, well, I'll, I'll throw Will's people a shout and take that one. Cheers. Um, I'm gonna go for a film that I'm actually very excited for, and a director that I really, really do like, and he's on a hot streak of form i'm gonna go for luca guadagnino's challenges oh. that was that was a, on my radar very excited for that film actually i'm actually excited i just clicked on it i was reading it. i'm more excited now yeah i am um, they dropped a new poster recently it's a really really good poster um cast is really good and the trailer was really intriguing i really like the trailer but yeah i, I haven't seen the trailer for it yeah cool good pick. have you not have you not seen like the whole thing about it like no, Zendaya. I just saw that one image of the two guys kissing Zendaya. Yeah. Like, the killers of the flower moon. That's the fucking only image they it's, released. Uh, the t- yeah, the trailer's, uh, trailer's pretty good, but I- I'm really excited for it. Huh. Okay, Ryan. Ryan, you? Okay. I will go Pixar's new film and say do it to it. Nice. I really hope this are, is good, man. You guys really, are ruining yeah. me. I have no more picks left. <laughs> the picks are safe. There's really not a lot good. to pick from. Like, this is a pretty yeah. weak year anticipation-wise. Like, it's one of the weakest in a while. Mm. Okay, I'm going to scroll deep. 
Okay, nah, to be fair, like my top five, I'm all really, really, really anticipating. You, I no, you know what? There's no ones on the board. There is like multiple yeah, ones I would be happy few. with on the board. I'm gonna take Kung Fu Panda Four, one of the greatest I'm... trilogies to ever grace the animated screen in Kung that Fu. That film is gonna be so bang average. I, you can I have really that. hope it's not. I really hope it's not, but it will be. <laughs> Um, do I get two in a row again? My guy, it's probably quicker if you take this exit. Um, dude, I'm like struggling to come up with 2024s. Um, Is that your last pick? I see. Don't know what I want. I've still got a um, couple. Sorry, guys. I'm looking. Good. There's a Sony film that has a trailer. <laughs> I don't want to take any of these, man. Wait, Sundance Film Festival. Okay, you Canada. know. No, Sundance is where are we? Calif that? California. Oh. That's Utah. Oh, interesting. I'm going to take... I'm, I've never heard of this film before. I don't even know if it's coming out in 2024. It says it's going to be coming out in 2024. It's called Cuckoo by Tillman Singer starring Hunter Oh, yeah, Hunter the Schaefer. horror film with um, Hunter Schaefer. I've, I've heard never heard of it, but it looks cool. I, uh, so I'm that'll be my last pick. Uh, Ryan? Okay. Um, I will go The Quiet Place spinoff, oh. which is directed by... Yeah, the guy who made Pig from 2021. That was a that's a good film. film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, so up and coming horror director. So he could be good. Um, I'm gonna go for one that Alex has already mentioned. I'm gonna go for M Night's Trap, which sounds really, really interesting, and I hope is good. Sounds like an I'm M very film. excited for that one. I'm that's in my top ten most anticipated. I'm very excited for that one. Yeah, it's 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 hovering around that area for me. But yeah, I am really excited for it. Well, luckily, I am in luck because my number one most anticipated film of 2024, more than Dune two, more than Mickey seventeen, my number one most anticipated film of 2024, Team Fuck Panthers is taking the one, the only. Sonic 3. Oh. Coming from my Sonic coming from my own. I, I was going to take it just to spite you, but then I was like, I can't. Dude, if you had taken if anyone had taken it, I was dead hanging up right now, and you would have not heard from me until next episode. Dude, there's no information on it. Are we sure it's coming out this year? I'm pretty yeah, sure. Christmas, Christmas, it has a release date. It's Christmas 24, and Shadow's going to be in that shit, so you know it's a banger. Nice. Those Prati's going to make way more money than that rubbish. I hope, dude. But you already know it's not. <laughs> no shot. No shot. You should have seen the applauses I've seen that movie get. That movie got roaring applauses the last Have one. You? What everyone says. What, from five-year-olds? <laughs> no, from for families, but yeah. <laughs> from families. Oh Painful God. cinema experience, that was Sonic 2. Yeah. Oh. Sonic 2 was okay, a well. fucking banger. Th that was our most anticipated 2024 draft. Of course, let us know what films you're excited for in this upcoming year. Let us know. We'll put a put a link to our Twitter. Vote who has the best team. Um, and of course, yeah, let us know what you think about all these movies. Um, but thanks so much for tuning in to the Shop by Shop podcast. And catch you later.